This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills. Good afternoon, everybody, and a very special warm welcome to the boys and girls of Hampton Oaks Elementary School in Virginia. Welcome to Juma in the Sabi Sands. My name is Steve Falkenbridge and I'm joined on camera by Sebastian Rombi. And we are actually down here by Chitu Watering Hole with some of our favorite animals. They're enjoying a little bit of the sunshine, as you can see. We have got some hippopotamuses over my shoulder and they are thoroughly enjoying being out in the sun. Please send your questions through with your teacher. Let us know what you'd like to talk about this afternoon. We are talking about hippos right now and there they've got some birds on their back that are looking for ticks and blood. Can you believe it? They like to, to eat and drink blood. How gross is that? Eating ticks is gross enough. But the reason they're out the water is that it is winter here in South Africa. In the southern hemisphere it is winter, in the northern hemisphere you are experiencing summer. And so in the winter months, the hippos get a little bit cold in the water. It's not a heated swimming pool. So you'll often find them sitting out in the sunshine in the day, having a little sleep, relaxing, because they're normally active at night. And they'll go out at night and walk very, very far to feed on grass with that very big mouth. Can you see that mouth there on the left of the screen? It's a little bit dirty. But she's having a proper little sleep. Very lazy hippos with the birds attending to their wounds and their ticks. And there's a lot of them here. Some of them are lying down with a little bit of bird poo on their bottom. There we go, a little bit uncomfortable. Look at the size of their mouth. They are such funny looking creatures, aren't they, hippopotamuses? Very funny looking creatures. There's some more birds. Well, boys and girls, it's not only me out this afternoon. There are three gentlemen, and I'm going to go over to my other friend, Sydney, who's out on bushwalk. A very, very good afternoon to you all. I am Sydney, and I am going to be your guide this afternoon. I am not traveling alone this afternoon. I am with Craig. He is my camera operator. I have got Herbert with me, who is uh, my game scout, the one who is going to identify tracks for us. Uh, my plan for this afternoon is quite very easy. I will be heading towards the southern side of the game reserve and see if I can find some of the interesting animals in the game reserve so don't forget to ask your teachers to ask us questions i will be with you on this guided walk as from now and i'm going to start my trekking here Uh, Leo, uh, to find the animals at this stage is not that very hard, but already I can see the sun is quite very hot, which might also make the animals to stay together under these uh, shades. So the chances of seeing the animals, they are there today. So animals they like it so i am not alone this afternoon here out i have got some other colleagues now we can go to ralph and see uh, what he's planning to do well hello and welcome to all the kiddies and we are coming to you from the kruger national park in south africa and those are a couple of uh, little boy impalas that are walking there through the bush and my name is ralph kirsten and i'm looking into the sun a little bit that's why i'm squinting my eyes and on the camera this afternoon i've got senzo hello senzo and hello once again to all of you now please don't forget to send us your questions through your teacher because we'd love to know what you would like to know about the african wilderness now i'm going to try and get a little bit closer to those uh, impala so we can see them a little bit better and Senzo is making lovely shade for me there now so I can look at you with my eyes open look at that okay are you ready for an African adventure let's go let's go and see these animals here now when we do get closer to the animals I will go a little bit softer because I don't want to scare them away so let's go up here and get a little bit closer to these two impala 
Now, Jessica, this safari park that we are in, I want to ask one of your teachers to show you a map because this safari park that we're in, it's about as big as Israel. And Israel is not a small country, so this safari park is huge. Oh, look, there's some more of these boys. Not just two, there's four. And then there's another one a little bit further up over there. So this safari park that we're in, it's as big as a country. Wow! And these animals are wild and free. They do not uh, listen to what we tell them. They will do whatever they want. They eat whatever they want. Look at that one. Looks like he's having a little snack on some of the grass over there. So these are called impala. Can you say that? Impala. Yes. And these are all boys because they've got horns. The girls don't have horns. And so we can very easily see the difference between the girls and the boys. And this looks like a little boys club. They're having fun this afternoon, I think. All the boys playing together. They're not hanging around with the girls today. They're all on their own. And you see how they wag their tails a little bit? That just keeps the flies away from their bottom. They do have very pretty tails, don't they? Luca, thanks for your question. This is an antelope. So an impala is an antelope. Right. So he's not uh, part of the leopard family or the lion family because those are cats aren't they? So what other kinds of antelope do we get? We get something called an nyala. We also get kudu. We also get bushbuck. Now I'm going to go a little bit forward because I think I saw an nyala over there. So let's go and see if we can see him in amongst the impala. There's a different kind of antelope here. There he is. Now, Luca, thanks again. Wow, you asking lots of questions, Luca. That's very good. I like lots of, lots of questions, and there's never a bad question, only a bad answer. So here, Luca, uh, these animals, that is an nyala now, a little bit different to the impala, but all of them, they eat grass and leaves from the tree. So look there, we can see that nyala now. He's eating a little bit on the tree, and he'll just be eating some of those juicy leaves that he sees there. But he's different to the impala. It's a little bit confusing, isn't it? We have impala and we have nyala. Well, this is a nyala. Okay, so we can see the difference. They don't look the same, do they? They both have horns, but they look very different to each other. And so, well, these antelopes seem to be enjoying their lunch of grass and leaves, and they are very different to what Steve has got, uh, and that's a hippo. Yes, indeed. Well, normally around this watering hole we find Nyala. They like to come and drink from time to time. But apart from hippos at the watering hole, it is pretty quiet here this afternoon. But we have no doubt there will be more animals coming down. They all need to drink. So you do find them coming. It's the hippos that are always here because they live in the water in the daytime. And only at night time will they go far away, as I said before. But they are such funny animals, just standing there in the sunshine. Hello Kendall, you want to know what they eat? Well, hippos feed on grass. So with that very big mouth, they act like a lawnmower really. They walk through and they just eat all the grass that they can get in, in their mouth. There's really no selection. They just eat what they can. Um, it's not a very, very good sort of adaptation, but with their big mouth, they just feed, 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 feed. Um, you see how it's standing there with its head down? They can walk, oh, there's a little baby popping up behind. So they walk like that, and they just turn their head from side to side, and they just munch. And they actually break the grass off with their lips. And their teeth are very, very poorly formed uh, for feeding, for eating. And so their lips are basically just breaking the grass, sort of like mowing the lawn, exactly like mowing the lawn. And hippos make very nice lawns around watering holes. 
and they are very important for the environment because they take all of that grass and then they come back to the watering hole and they do lots of pooing inside. I know that might sound really, really disgusting, but all of that poo goes in and it's organic material. It goes in and it feeds all of the fish, lots and lots of fish, and there's lots of birds that feed on the fish. And there's also lots of birds, or there's also crocodiles that feed on the fish. There we go. Look at that youngster. That youngster's back has been ripped apart. We think maybe that one was attacked by lions, a pride of lions, and it got a really hard go one evening. I'm not really sure, but look at all those wounds on the back. But don't worry, it's okay. Zoe, you want to know how old they can get? Hippos can get up to about 40, maybe 42 years of age. That's quite old for an animal, but very slow growing. That's why when you see youngsters like that, they spend lots of, oh, there we go. Look at that big mouth. Now you can see the lips. There's no teeth in the front of the mouth there for feeding. Those teeth that you see are for fighting and for, for fighting against lions if lions try to fight them or crocodiles or if they get bigger and they're a big male, uh, then they use it for fighting other males and also for protecting their babies. But not really very well adapted for eating those teeth. Luca, you want to know how big they get? Well, a hippo can get up to about two and a half thousand kilograms. So you'd say the biggest hippo, probably about 5,000 pounds or so, give or take a few pounds this way or that. But that's pretty big for an animal to be out here. But that's why they like the water. See, when they go into the water, they don't have any weight. They're very, very buoyant, like a whale. And you see when they're lying on the bank, they're very flat. They leave a very big imprint in the ground. And it's very funny. People actually have said that they are part of the whale family now. Isn't that strange? They don't look anything like whales, do they? But because they live in water, and they can also feed in water, and they also have their babies in water, and they can talk underwater, they say these guys must be whales. I find that very funny. Whales with feet. Jay Zari, those birds are holding on to the hippo, and you can actually see that one there. Look at it, the one on the bottom. There's a whole big scratch on the side of the hippo, and there's a red liquid dripping down. Some of it is blood. Some of it is a sun cream that the hippo gives off. And those birds, they normally feed on ticks. And we know what ticks feed on. They like to suck blood, don't they? Um, and those birds feed on ticks, so they'll be feeding on ticks that might be on the hippo, but then they also feed feeding on the scars and the wounds because they're actually looking for the blood. It's very, very gross, isn't it? But look at the size of them. Such big animals. Now, if you're walking on foot in the bush, you didn't, do not want to see one of these anywhere nearby. When I grew up, I used to think the all dead plant material, such as the branches and the wood lying on the ground, detifies the felt. Until I have realized that it is very wrong to come and pick up the old dead plant material and use them as firewood. Why? Because these kind of branches, they are there now waiting for some of the animals, such as the small termites, to come and eat them so that they can bring back everything to the soil. So what we must do is to take away the plastics, the bottles, as well as the tins. Those are the things that detifies the environment. Branches, they are part of the natural process, which is called a nutrient cycle. A nutrient cycle is a process whereby you are going to find organisms that are called decomposers. The decomposers are the organisms which are responsible to break down the dead bodies of plants and animals. So if you look at this tree right here behind me, it doesn't have leaves and it is like an umbrella. This tree
tree drops the leaves during the dry season and when the leaves get to the ground those leaves again becomes part of the food for the tree again to eat because this is going to fertilize this area is going to make this area very nutrient rich and that is how trees survives that is how grasses survives so if you collect the wood from the field we are disturbing and nature is going to battle in order to build nutrients for the future generation of the upcoming plants so i am now just going to check if i can find anything interesting Um, Messi, I didn't get that question very well. If you can repeat that, uh, FC. Uh, I didn't get. I just got that if I can eat the plants, something. So I, I didn't get the question very well. But the question was uh, to do with eating some parts of the plants. There are some of the plants that we can eat. Um, you must remember that plants provide us with a lot of things. Some of these plants, they provide us with fruits. Like this tree next to me, this is called a marula tree. It's one of the trees that are very much beneficial to the animals and to us as human beings. From this plant, we eat the marula fruit. And this fruit also, it creates beer. We also make a traditional beer out of the fruit. Some of the trees, we eat them as medicines. We eat some of the leaves from these trees and some of them we eat the roots. And some when hungry we can also eat the leaves. And those leaves they don't affect us with anything. There are trees, yes, in Juma that I can eat for medicinal purposes. And some I can eat for a diet. So now let's go to Ralph. He is my colleague on the other side and see what Ralph is having at the moment. Well, remember everybody, I told you that those other antelope that we saw were all the boys. Well, we managed to find where all the girls were hiding. And these are Nyala girls. And you see how they got little white stripes and no horns? They look a little bit like Bambi, don't they? And they're also having a little bit of lunch. It seems like everyone's a bit hungry now. It's about that time. There's a little baby. Wow. See, they're very cute, aren't they? Uh, Elvis, thanks for your question. Yes, I love being a safari person. Uh, this is great to be out in the wild. I don't have to worry about traffic and getting to uh, work. I just wake up in the morning and jump in my vehicle and I come looking for animals. It's always exciting because we never know what's going to happen because these animals aren't trained, they aren't tame, and that they do what they are supposed to do out in the wilderness. So every day is different, and it's always exciting. So some days we find lots of animals, other days they're hiding, and maybe they don't want to show themselves. So, but today I think we're going to be lucky, and I think I'm going to try my best to find some giraffe, and elephants um, but we'll have to see if they want to show themselves because we don't always find them but i will try my best that's all that i can do hey we always try our best now sebastian the lions i don't know where they are we haven't seen them for the last few days so we'll have to look for them maybe we'll be lucky and we see some lions today as well so that's what i'm going to look for sebastian i'll try my best lions elephants and giraffe should we go and look for them i think we should because these antelope they've now headed off into the bushes we can't really see them anymore so let's carry on and see what else we can find i'm sure that something will be down here in this little river line here 
Uh, Zoe, yes, we do sometimes see quite a lot of giraffe, but they like the lions as well. They come and go, and they're always looking for something to eat at the top of the trees, because giraffe are so tall that they can reach right up top of the trees, and that's where they like to eat. So now I'm going to drive in the sand here. Very exciting because I get to use my 4x4 Jeep. Look at this. We're going to drive in the sand here. All right, so let's go along in the sand here and see if we can find elephants, giraffe and lion. But I'm not the only one driving around in the sand. Well, Ralph is asking a lot. Hopefully he can find all of those things for you. But what I've got you, I'm just going to quickly show you. Oh, you've got an animal. Okay, well good, we got an animal. I was going to show you something that was from an animal, but seeing as Sebastian has spotted a beautiful water buck there, let's go with that. Look at that as a really big male. Much bigger than the, the Nyala and the Impala that Ralph was showing you. And also you can see, because it's got horns, it is a male. And the males use those for fighting each other. And you never find water buck too far away from the water. They like to eat grass. They like to drink a lot. And often you find the male on their own. It seems very lonely, doesn't it? Sometimes you don't find him with any ladies. Sometimes you find him with lots of ladies. Leo, no, we don't touch any of the animals. These animals are all very, very wild. Here he's coming. And uh, they don't want us to touch them, and we, we don't get that close. Um, they do sometimes come quite close to us. You feel like you'd be able to touch them, but it's not a good idea. It's not a petting zoo or anything like that. This is the 100% wild wilderness. And the animals actually are quite afraid of us. So if I got out the car and went towards him to try and touch him, he would probably run away. If he was too close, if I was too close, he could maybe try hit me with those horns. But Wesley, we're perfectly safe from most of the animals out here. We have lots and lots of years of training to do what we do. And uh, the animals, some of the animals that are what we call potentially dangerous, they have got... Um, you know, if you understand their behavior, you understand what they're doing and how their life is and what's going on, then everything is perfectly normal and perfectly fine. But if you don't understand, yes, well, you could get yourself in a whole lot of trouble. Just like if you go to the woods in America and you don't know how to deal with bears, well, you could probably get yourself in a bit of trouble. Jessica, we don't really help animals if they're sick. It's a natural environment out here and uh, the survivor of the fittest talks about animals that are strong will go forward and animals that are ill or sick or injured, well then they generally get picked off by the predators. Lions and leopards and hyena will basically pick off those animals and they will be removed from the population. And uh, so the ones that didn't get sick, well, they carry on and they have babies and then those babies stay very strong. That's basically the way it works out, yeah? So no, we don't help the animals. And that was a beautiful water buck. He's probably on his way down to Chitwa watering hole. As I suggested, there'll be more animals coming down to drink. We moved around to see if we could find you something else and there we got him. Very good. Did well, while we try and find you another animal, let's go back over to Sydney, who's walking in the dry grass. I am just now leaning against one of the very beautiful big houses. This is very much hard. And who built this is one of the very interesting insects. This was built by the termites. And the termites can be able to build this from inside. And if you can check now, they are not even opening any holes, any valves uh, for breathing. They can do that. They do have some of the areas whereby they are opening this. So these termites, 
A lot of people, they like to come and destroy them and open them. And if you are doing that, you are disturbing because you are now letting their predators to come in and harvest them. Inside here, there's millions. And how this house started, it was interesting. This house has been started by just two. And these two, it was during the summer season. Summer season is when the, those termites which are responsible to start their own colonies fly and then two of them, you will see them following each other and they land. Where they are going to land is where they are going to start walking to the nearest little hole where they're going to drill and after drilling, they are going to lay eggs. And the first little ones to come out, they are going to have the workers. Workers are the ones responsible to build this. And as soon as they see that now the workers need protection, then the queen is going to again lay the soldiers to come and protect the workers. And after that, when this uh, kind of a termite mound has matured, they are now going to have those ones that must fly and start new colonies. So it's about a million of them. If you come and destroy here, you are exposing the life of millions of insects inside here. So these are some of the things. Uh, uh, these are some of the things we have to treat nicely. We don't have to expose them. They are part of the natural system, and they deserve to live. I have seen a lot of people creaking these kind of termite mounds and not worried about how they are living and what they are going to do. Yes. The workers, which are responsible to build, they will react and try to cover the damage. But these insects, they have got a lot of predators, including ants, including birds, and including some of the big animals, such as the artifact. Artifact is that animal with a very long nose. And the artivolve. Artivolve is one of the small animals which looks like a hyena a little bit with a small uh, sloping back. Those animals, they come and feed on these insects. So let's try by all means and leave these insects alone. Sassilo, uh, water, this termite mound is waterproof. It can rain 80%, it's not going to dissolve it. This is very much hard. And some of the people in Africa, they are even using the abandoned termite mounds. They come and take this kind of, of clay and they mix them and they are going to build houses from the old termite mounds. And those houses, they become very much strong. So it's quite a lovely house and water is prevented to enter here. Uh, Luca, these termites, they live like this. They can, they can be able to create the temperature up to 36 to 37 degrees Celsius. And now that is part of the similarity between these termites and us because if you can check, our body temperature is mostly 36 to 37 degrees. These termites in here, they have got different structures. They have got soldiers which are responsible to defend. They have got workers which are there to build. And they have got reproductives which are there to fly and lay eggs and they come out here for feeding purposes how they feed is interesting and they think about each other and they care about each other they come out they harvest the vegetation material and bring it under the ground and build food in the form of fungus and that is what they eat and they drink water under the ground whereby there is closest water flowing. These termites, everything is happening and they even know when the rain is coming. It has been uh, indicated that the termites can be able to detect the baromatic pressure. The pressure to do with the air temperature. When it's dropping down, they know. When it's raising high, they know. That is why during the dry season, they go very far away from the ground. Come summer season, they come very close to the ground. These insects are very much uh, clever and they are one of my favorites. So now I am going to search for more interesting things. Let's see how my other colleagues are doing. 
Well, I promised I would show you some of it, and we've come along the road and we found an area where at least three hippopotamuses probably got a bit lazy on their way back from night foraging. The watering hole is down that way, and they came walking down, and they got a bit lazy, and then they lay down in the sand. I'm going to show you like this. I'm very small compared to the hippo. They lay down in the sand with their body, and here you can see the big pile of poo at the back here. This is hippo dung. Oh, it's still wet. It's still wet, and I'm going to bring it to you. So one, two hippos lay here. This one lay for a while, and then it repositioned its body and put its bum that side. <laughs> Very funny. Have a look at this. It's still wet and steamy. Yes, I am touching hippo dung. It smells okay. It doesn't smell too bad. I'm not going to eat it though. But there you can see. Is that alright, Seb? Yeah. You can see all the grass inside there. And that's how bad the hippo. They just break it off with their teeth. They don't really have much chewing power. Now I'm going to break this open. A ball of poo. There we go. You can see inside there now. It's all grass vegetation. And most of the time they take this grass back and they spread it inside the dam in the watering hole. And that's what the fish feed on. And all sorts of insects will grow and all sorts of nutrients are given into the water. I know uh, Sydney was talking about nutrients. So they're bringing it from outside and putting it inside the watering hole. And that actually creates a huge amount of life for lots of birds and lots of animals and birds. The whole circle of life. And all it is is a little ball of poo. I'm going to put it back where I found it because that's where it belongs. Well, it's kind of in the road here, so it's probably not going to do very well, but there we go. And lots of flies and insects will come and feed on that as well, and certain birds will come and scratch it around, and insects will grow, and the whole life is moving. And all it was was a big animal with a big mouth feeding on grass. Should we try? It's really not very good. It's really not very good. But that's what you do. That's what the hippos do out here. Feed on the grass. To them it must taste absolutely fantastic. To me I think I'm spoilt. We've got nice chefs in nice shops that we go to to buy the food. The animals out here, this is what they have. Look at that environment there trees and grasses and they have to survive out here. And if they don't eat and get strong, well they get picked off one by one. So it's important to be very strong out in the environment so you can avoid the big predators. Well we're going to move off from here. Let's go back up to Ralph. He's busy driving. Well, yes, that sounds like Steve was having fun eating some uh, different plants there. Well, I'm still just driving. I managed to get out of the sand, luckily for me. So we're still all right, but we haven't found any elephants just yet. But we're still looking and we're driving along, just going nice and slowly, just to see if we can find anything. Now, Rachel, you want to know which is the scariest animal here. I have to say that it's a, a big snake called a black mamba. Now, I think that's the most scary snake uh, animal. But, well, there's an animal just up ahead here that's not very scary at all. Let's just see if we can see him. Oh, he's running along the little log there. Uh, it's a little squirrel, but he's very fast. And he's disappeared off there behind. Can you see him? You've got him. There he is. That's a little tree squirrel. He's not very scary at all, is he? He's uh, a little bit like that squirrel on Ice Age. Have you seen that movie? He's always looking for his little nut. 
And this squirrel and all the squirrels out here are no different. They're always looking for their little nuts. And in winter, you know what they do? They go and bury their nuts so that they can come back and they can eat whenever they want. Now that little squirrel, he's gone all the way on the other side of the bank already. There he's on a the branch. There he is. He's got a very fluffy tail, doesn't he? And he's a very good tree climber. I like climbing trees, don't you? Very lots of fun, but I can't climb as well as a squirrel can. Look how quickly he goes. Yo! Wow! I would have to say one of the best tree climbers out here is a squirrel. But he's disappeared off there into the bushes. So, I think it's time for us once again to carry on the search. What else are we going to find? I'm uh, still looking for those elephants and giraffe. Maybe we'll even get lucky and see a leopard. Now, Lucas, uh, we don't get any flying squirrels here, but these squirrels can jump so far that it seems like they're flying. But they aren't flying squirrels, not like those ones that they have the little wings between their arms. No, these ones just run and jump, and they are very good at climbing in the trees. But no flying squirrels. We do get bats and lots and lots of different kinds of birds. So I'll also also show you some different kinds of birds now as well. Now Luca, mongoose also don't fly, but they're very fast running on the ground. And they're not as good as the squirrels that climb the trees. It's almost like the difference between lions and leopards. Leopards can climb the trees very, very well, but uh, the, <laughs> the lions, they don't climb very well at all. So the squirrels, they climb very well, and the mongoose, they don't climb very well because they're adapted a little bit differently hey so not all the animals can do the same things some can fly some can climb some can run very fast others are very slow like a tortoise but he carries his house around him on his back so he doesn't need to be very fast and I wonder if we'll see any tortoises we don't see too many around at this time of the year because it's winter. So there's not so much warmth, so, so they get very cold and they just stay inside their house. You know when it's very cold, you also want to stay in your house, don't you? So that's what the tortoise does. He just stays in his house when it's cold. When it gets very hot, then he might come out. Now I'm going to see if there's any animals coming down to drink at the water hole and I hear that Sydney he's gone to a dry water hole. I just got here now and during my arrival I heard a little bit of noise coming from this side and when checking I just saw a little bit of a shape showing that that animal might have been a hyena. Now I want to take you through this, he, this area here where I am now. So the reason why I am battling to find animals this afternoon is that the animal activities are also determined by water availability. So some of these animals at this stage they are traveling long distances because the areas whereby they were depending on when it comes to water availabilities are starting to get dry. So this is showing you now that we are right in the middle of the dry season. So this kind of place reminds me of while I was still very young. A clay like this is usable. Uh, I used to, do, to attend school from Monday to Friday. And every Wednesday it was art. So we used to come here and from the mud and build the animals. So I, my favorite animal was the elephant. So we used to come and use this mud and then we build animals and we take these animals for a competition. I have won a competition before and that competition involves uh, our school at the beginning and get who the best artist is. And after that you compete with the other schools from the region. But when it goes to the region, I lost the battle, I lost the competition. But the initial stage, I took the title. So this kind of soil, this kind of clay, if you, you build something out of of it it is going to last very much long you can see that it's even very much difficult to break it
you can see so it's quite a very uh, lovely soil if you want to make something and here there's even some sand there which is making it more hard so this place it reminds me from while i was still very young some other people they eat this but they don't eat it for a diet uh, some of this kind of clay which are more red it indicates a lot of iron availability so if you you come to some of the areas here in africa like south africa you will see some of the people eating this in order to get some minerals so we don't go and buy minerals we can get minerals just uh, everywhere so let me now try and investigate Uh, Nathan, I have, I used to work as a guide since the beginning of 2007. I was working for the South African National Parks and there I was a lead guide. I was the one who was taking people on guided walks. So I used to approach all these kind of different big five animals and I have been charged on several occasions. <laughs> I have survived the situation. It's normal. The animals, they've got to investigate. So I am just now going to try and check the animals which are making noise in this area. Let me now try and pick up the tracks. Yes, oh well, look at, we've got little animals running. He's going to stop now. They're going to stand behind the bushes there. That is a male steenbok. You can just make out the sharp horns on the top of the head. And would you believe it, boys and girls, that is a fully grown male animal. It is one of the smallest antelope that we find in the area. And he's got a little girlfriend he's about to walk up to. There he is. There she is. How beautiful are they? Look at how big their ears are. And they are busy feeding. They are, look at their mouth. Their mouth is very small, not like the hippo's mouth. So these individuals can be very picky on what they feed on. They can take very small leaves from the grass and very small tasty titbits from the trees. And you can see underneath their feet, the ground is a little bit dark because they put a fire through here. Fire is a very important element in the ecosystem of the savanna that we're in. And there was a fire, that's why you can see it's black. And often the fire will cause the grass to grow again. And that's what the steenbok are looking for. Any fresh, tasty leaves. They, not like the hippo that just eats a huge amount of, of sort of poor quality food, the steenbok will select very, very, very good bits and pieces. And aren't they beautiful? They will, they will live together for life, the male and female. So romantic. Okay, well, from one small antelope to probably the smallest mammal we find in the area. Well, look at this. We said that we wanted to see a mongoose. Well, this is a little dwarf mongoose, a very small one. It's almost the same size as the squirrel, but he's very different to the little squirrel. Like I said, these mongoose, they don't climb trees like the squirrel does, but they're very good at digging. That's what they can do. And they don't eat nuts like the, uh, like the squirrel does. These ones, they eat little insects and termites and ants and crickets and locusts and all sorts of little things. So they're quite ferocious little hunters. Oh, the mongoose. And I wonder what he's looking for. Looks like he's foraging as well, also looking for his lunch. But he's not eating leaves and grass like the Nyala and Impala were and not looking for nuts like the squirrel was. But he's probably gonna dig around. Look, he's quite curious of us, hey? And I wonder where his friends are because there's normally lots of them around. So we might see some more of them. They stay together as a very close family, do the mongoose, these dwarf mongoose.
Now, Rachel, do you want to know if I've seen a mongoose and a hippo fight? Well, I haven't ever seen that. I think um, I know who's going to win that. I think the hippo will just squish him with one foot underneath his big body. Hey, he'll squash him. So I don't think the mongoose is going to stay around if a hippo gets angry. But what I have seen mongoose fighting with is snakes. Now, oh, that's amazing to watch because the snake has got venom and he could kill the mongoose if he bites him. But the mongoose are so fast that they can bite him in the front and bite him at the back. And the mongoose are normally the ones that win. And they, and they even eat snakes as well. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? So these little guys, they are very, very fast and they all work together as a team. Oh, there's another one. See? I knew that his friends wouldn't be far. There's another one running with him through the bushes and they're disappearing off there. I wonder what else is around here next to the water hole. We are sitting... Oh, there he is. He's popped out. So, kiddies, I hope you've enjoyed us with this afternoon out here in the African wilderness because we're going to say goodbye to you now. It's gone so quickly, hasn't it? Well, I hope that you're going to join us again. But for now, I'm going to give you a salute and I'm going to say goodbye while I send you on over to Sydney. A very, very good afternoon, and my name is Sydney. I am traveling with Craig this afternoon and Herbert as my game scout. We are going to be with you now on this game walk. And for your questions and comments, you can follow us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live, and also on YouTube chat stream. I have got something very much interesting to show you already here on the ground. I am right at the kill. It's not a fresh kill. It's an old kill. To me, it seems like the kill was for this morning. Um, I'm trying to investigate what happened, but it's difficult to see the signs. Uh, the animal that has been caught here, looking at this hair, this was a scrub hair. So this animal got the scrub hair. You can even see there the saliva when this animal was eating. Not too sure if maybe it was Tingana, because this morning Tingana was also spotted roaming around. Now, let's see what type of prey was this one. So the type of stomach this prey has got is a simple stomach. A simple stomach, it means it's just one chamber. So this animal, when looking at these droppings, the lining is showing me that it is true this was a scrub hair because the scrub hair's droppings they look exactly the same like this but here is when they were still in the intestines so these are the droppings scrub hair is defecating and eat again at the same time in order to get more nutrients so i'm lucky this is my first no, no not my first kill yeah, but on a guided walk is my first kill. So this has been a scrub hair caught. According to this kind of evidence, it's showing me that this happened this morning. So there's something I must have to... Uh, see now, the this, this scrub hairs, they've got quite a lot of different predators, including birds. Some of the big birds, like the Marshall eagles, can be able to take away the scrub hair. The, the, the predators such as the cats, including the jackals, and the cats such as the, the cheetahs, leopards as well. Sometimes lions, they do. When they're battling to target the big animals, they sometimes just take the scrub hair just to uh, reduce hunger a little bit and carry on looking for more. So this has been a scrub hair. So I'm now going to move and see. Maybe I will find out who caught the scrub hair this morning. So now let's let's go to Steve and see Steve what he's having on the other side. Well, we are on. Wow, that is crazy. That foxtail drongo is mimicking the arrow mark babbler. Oh. 
The fork tail dragon, not a babbler hoopoo. It was mimicking an African greenwood hoopoo. Oh. <laughs> that was very cool. There's a greenwood hoopoo here. It was actually following them. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe I just heard it wrong. It's just flown off. Hello, everybody. We are making our way over towards Buffalsook watering hole. See if we can see if we can follow up on um, any tracks of, of Tundi and Tlalamba this morning that kind of came into this northerly direction. Oh, there's some some tracks on the road, joined with a a little bit of dung. Can you see it, Seb? It's a pile of of droppings in the road and uh, they are very nice little round sort of cocktail sausages with the tracks there just off to the right hand side just a bit more left Seb you had them in frame there they are beautiful tracks there of a porcupine feeding on the bark of a tree they're very nice cocktail sausage like shape but we're going to move on from the dung. We're going to see if we can pick up on some fresh tracks. And being quite a warm day, there's a good chance that Tandi and have come towards the watering hole to come and have a drink. We'll have a little look-see. You can hear some people on the radio suggesting the same thing about following up on the cats from this morning. Tingana crossed south over Gary Main and um, that was the end of him, but you know, he comes back, he'll be back again. Just got to keep nice and close to the ground. This is an area that Tundi, the beautiful leopardess, really, really enjoys. We had a few steenbok just before. She's quite partial to the small antelope, such as steenbok and daker. She's got a very good technique for hunting them, sniffing them out in the undergrowth. because they do stand very still and it's very hard to see them if they don't move. Okay, well, we're almost at the watering hole, but before we get there, let's go over to Ralph and see what he's up to for the afternoon. Well, I'm doing something very similar to what you're doing, Steve. I'm trying to catch up um, on some uh, report of a leopard that crossed from Voyotella Access uh, to Galago Shortcut. Now, this is Galago Shortcut heading towards our northern boundary. Now, welcome back to all the regular viewers once again. And please don't forget to send us your questions and your comments on the um, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat. Get involved in this interactive Safari, tell us what you'd like to know, what you'd like to see, etc. etc. Now, before the um, school drive started, oh, I see this track here. I think he meant that it crossed going the other way. Now, I wonder if it's Hukumuri, because in this area here, I would think that it might be. I think it's the hook. I think I'm going to try and follow up on it. So Conrad, the tech guy, he's actually spotted it crossing, um, but that's all he said. So I didn't check with him actually which way it went. But the tracks never lie, and it went that way. So that's perfect. Now we know. I was just about to ask him until I found the tracks. So that's perfect. And um, before the school drive started, I went out to where Tristan was following those hyenas this morning, and eventually where they sort of laid down. Um, um, and assumed or thought possibly uh, very exciting that maybe it's a hyena den. Um, that area, because I returned there now just before the school drive, and that area looks like it is a perfect potential spot, but unfortunately I didn't find any hyenas. So if it was the den site, um, well, maybe we need to try again in the morning hours. Maybe we'll see them a little bit more active and maybe get some more clues. So it's not a write-off, but I did lose a little bit of hope that it is a den site. But we do know that in the afternoons, very often you can go to a den site and they're either all down in their hole um, or the other one's lying up in the grass. So it's not always the best to go and look in the afternoon. I just got very excited, however, because you know, uh, the regular viewers would know how much I like uh, being around hyenas. So that was, um, uh, obviously I couldn't contain myself. I headed straight there, but uh, with no luck. 
So I'll just have to keep trying. Maybe I'll go and check it again in the morning. It does look like a very good potential site for a hyena den. And it was also, I've chatted with a few other guys um, and we all concur that that area, uh, sort of between Mamba and Batalur, um, in that section of the reserve, uh, would make for a perfect uh, area for a hyena den. So I'm going to keep on working that area and hopefully I can find it before I leave. And that would be a fantastic thing for me to do before I leave. I love doing something like that um, before uh, leaving a spot. You know, something substantial. Well, I've done nothing substantial yet on this drive, so we'll just have to keep looking and hopefully we get lucky. But it seems like Steve's got one of those swimming reptiles. Yes, we do indeed. We've gotten all the way to Biffelsuk watching hole in search once again of the illustrious scuba Steve himself. And I suppose it's only been three minutes, so he might still be holding his breath, but Scuba is nowhere to be seen. And even his terrapin buddies who like to swim and ride on his back are feeling a little bit forlorn in the middle of that very large watering hole. I suppose it's getting smaller and smaller by the day for Scuba, but for the terrapins, it is still an enormous body of water. Well, they are reptiles, and they are... In Enjoying the coolness of the water and they will get out into the sun to warm up. But talking about warming up in the sun, we flew here this morning in the, the, with the drone and we had a look with the thermal imagery and it's quite incredible how these buffalo weaver nests that you're looking at now in the top of this tree, how warm they are. They've got this really nice sort of heat signature and that's exactly the purpose. Buffalo weavers don't only nest in them for babies, they also roost throughout the year. So in the winter months, they will also nest in there to keep themselves nice and warm. And uh, they will often build them on the western side of trees. And that's a good way of navigating. And it's because the sun setting in sort of the west, northwest sort of side, uh, that gives the, the, the nest warmth through a little bit later into the day. I think that's quite marvelous. Something I've always known, but physically seeing it with a the thermal drone, it's quite something Oh, Seb, we've got a little fellow here. I wonder if you can get him. We've got a little happy fellow here. Southern yellow-billed hornbill, who's enjoying a little bit of a preening. He is the most relaxed southern yellow-billed hornbill around. He sits here. There's the preen gland on the, on the back of his bottom there. He goes and gets some oil from it, and then he'll go through each of his feathers, cleaning himself, preening, cleaning getting all of the mites and out of his feathers and also uh, oiling them, giving them back their water, sort of, so their water, what's the word? Repellent, sort of feeling, <laughs> feeling. Where have my words gone? But the birds will do this every day, sometimes twice a day. And this guy, the reason why he's super relaxed is this is a, a common sort of sundown at a coffee spot. So I've no doubt he often nabs the scraps of rusks or fruit and that's probably not ideal but he has I've had him come right up to me before demanding a piece of my my orange I said no of course I don't feed wildlife it is against my ethics but invariably every now and again in the industry wildlife will come across food there we go he's getting his preen oil again he feels underneath his arm, but needs a little bit more work. Notice how he's, because he's on his own, he gets the preen oil on his beak. That takes a moment of his eyes being away. And then he comes back. He has another scan around before starting to preen, because there are certain raptors that would quite easily take him out while he's not paying attention. And there we go. He's satisfied that nothing is stalking him in the wind. Really good for the thyroid to be able to move your neck like that. Opens up the thyroid. I don't know if a bird has got a thyroid, but imagine being able to, to lick your elbow like that, right on the shoulder. Very nice. The beak is the modified hands. They do everything with their beak. 
And if you're ever in doubt about what a bird feeds on, have a look at their beak. It'll always give you a good indication. And the hornbill is quite sort of versatile in how they feed and what they feed on. Jennifer, there's a number of hornbills. I mean, here in the, the southern, or in the Great Kruger, we get this one, the southern yellow build. We get the southern red build. We get the African gray. We, I've seen the trumpet hornbill here. I don't think you get the crowned hornbill here, but it's possible. Uh, more in sort of taller trees, sort of more forested, wet areas. The southern ground hornbill. Um, that is the extent of it that you find in the savannah biome. And you go over to Namibia, there's a few more species there, and then throughout Africa, there's a number of other species uh, to add to the list and they're all very very similar in shape and if you've seen one hornbill you very easily if you're in the right area and you look at the right book be able to identify the others but offhand I couldn't tell you how many it's probably about 20 odd species in Africa but that is an absolute guess right now I haven't ex I haven't traveled most of Africa yet so I couldn't quite tell you but he is a beautiful fellow also commonly known as the flying banana <laughs> Paula has got beautiful shoulder pads and beautiful spots there on the wing. A very long tail. And if you see the hornbill flight, you've seen the Lion King. The Lion King um, depicts it beautifully, that flap, flap, glide motion. It's a very sort of energy efficient way of flying. It doesn't require too much energy because it's half flying, half gliding using that long tail but it doesn't allow them to fly very quickly so they're not a speed specialist they just need to cover ground and there's lots of trees around here so the hornbills spend a fair amount of time hopping from tree to tree but then with their syndactyl feet meaning two toes fused on the outside and one on the inside they're able to hop around quite nicely on the ground in search of all sorts of tidbits we see them hopping and walking looking for termites sifting through the dung of, of rhino and elephant and even hippo I suppose looking for insects and any seeds that might be deposited there and there's always time to admire the view very interesting eyes. Well, we're going to move on from Bilfus Hall. Well, it's official at Sydney uh, that uh, Scuba Steve has not materialised. And let's go back over to Sydney, who's going to show you a track. I am very lucky enough now. I found something very much interesting. I'm just going to circle it for you so that you can see it nicely. Uh, this track is from one of the lovely cats. This is Tandy. So Tandy has been here, and I am sure Kalamba is also somewhere hiding in the same area. I have been uh, down the drainage line, uh, the dry river bed, and here by the dry river bed is where most cats they prefer to go and ha and hide during the day. But not only the cats, dry river beds such as this one, you also find animals such as buffaloes they go and hide there so quite a lot of animals including elephants they like to come and they will be taking this dust and just throwing the dust everywhere on their bodies just to try and cool their body temperature so now i've got a clue that here where i am tandy is somewhere so i've got something very interesting here again to show you not very far away from the track so if you can show here, Craig, so that I can show them something. I just picked up this very lovely big dropping. Uh, the color, it looks like a banana brown bread. This is from the elephant. And the elephant droppings, yes, they are medicinally used in various manners. And one of these uses, I am going to tell you now. Uh, when there is a delay when it comes to the pregnancy, if the pregnancy is is taking longer than expected 
then we take the woman and we take the, the concoction of the droppings for the elephants and we give them to drink and after drinking that is going to quicken everything in a very short space we are going to see the baby coming so elephant droppings they can also be used you just have to mix them with water and that water you can give it to somebody to drink then it's going to work other people if there is a delay and it was expected that the baby will be coming at let's say for instance eight o'clock at night and now it's half past eight nine o'clock if they give this to that woman uh, the baby is going to come out anytime from there you will see and some other people they use it uh, from the beginning of the onset of delivering the pregnancy they give them these kind of droppings to drink and then it also quickens the process so the elephant droppings, they are very much important and people are using them and it works. The interesting part is it doesn't affect the health status of the newborn. It's natural. So now let's see, maybe we're going to be lucky and find uh, a, a Tandy here in this area. So let's go to the water hole and see what's happening there. Well, swishing tails and grazing mouths. That's what's happening with the warthogs. Oh, and toilet stops with the impala curiously watching in the background. So it's always difficult, to, it seems, to get pretty close to the warthogs. They always run off. Um, so we haven't seen them well put them on camera for a while so i thought i'd just stop here because these two were a little bit obliging until uh, just a couple of seconds before we actually got them on the camera and then they ran off behind these uh, bushes but anyway that's probably the best sighting we've had in quite some time with the impala quite curious in the background um i'm just heading a bit west uh, this afternoon for now. I just want to see if I can uh, find out if uh, Hukamuri is walking around here. I would love to see him and that would be wonderful. It's probably second best to finding the hyena den would be finding Hukamuri, the Mike Tyson of the leopards in this area. And this warthog is now quite happy just to be resting you know behind the bushes there he feels quite rather safe didn't feel safe out in the open a little bit closer to us and so just hit a bit of a jog and then went round on that side there were two or three of them there he starts moving off now i think it's a female actually not a massive one but a warthog all the same in the swede family Now, Google, um, these uh, warthogs, they don't really hurt their noses when they dig. They obviously use their snouts to um, excavate artfolk burrows a little bit more. So they don't actually dig the entire burrow. They just take out a little bit more. And what they also do is, which is quite special, inside those artfolk burrows is to um, make a little ledge for the piglets that they can raise them up that if it had to rain, the adults can lie down in the mud and the babies who don't have as much fat on them, uh, they can lie up on the ledge, which means that they um, wouldn't get too cold. And well, the fatties, the adults, they lie down in the mud and it's not a problem really for them. But the little babies could get very cold and even die if they were exposed to the water or the cold mud that uh, would generally collect if it had to rain. And they normally back in, so bum first, and then they've obviously got those very um, big tusks as defense, uh, you know, so going out head first if they had to exit the burrow. But it's quite funny watching them reverse 
into the burrow around the hours of sunset. That's when they normally head for the burrow. And we've, we've actually seen that Hukumuri has caught the odd warthog um, returning home a little bit late. And so that's when um, you come home late and in the darkness hours, you're taking a real risk of, with your life. And if Hukumuri catches you out your burrow, well, you're going to probably pay with your life and he'll eat you. So let's, um, let's head on. I think that's a lucky omen to have found some warthogs because uh, we do know that Hukumuri really likes to eat them so hopefully we'll find him next I'm hoping for that let's see so let's head on west let's go towards Impala Plains Sandy Patch let's just check and see if he hasn't come out there then he may be um, still around quarantine we heard some squirrels alarm calling so I've sort of banked that I just wanted to come and check west first and then uh, if we don't come right on this side I'll go do a loop along um, Aubrey's and uh, Gallagher shortcut and then maybe on Vubu and then um, go and check quarantine and maybe the area around camp and who knows we might uh, get lucky and find the hukumuri right while we head on out on our search pattern let's head you off to steve who i think has left biffle's hook yes we have left biffle's hook we're heading south now on uh, nyala road north and i just had some tracks a moment ago on what looked like a male leopard so i'm just gonna see if i can kind of get my head around where they've gone coming south from the watering hole is over there and they're kind of heading in this direction i don't know if anyone's driven here this morning but this is the area we're kind of hoping to find tundi in male leopard who could it be i'm not going to assume after getting it wrong yesterday thinking i was tracking hosana to find out it was Tingana. Well, it just goes to show how big Hosanna's feet or how big Hosanna's feet have gotten because Tristan even told me, don't worry, you won't identify the two. They are very similar now. And that was good for me to, to hear. It's a tricky area to track though. And if the leopard is here, very hard to find. Seven years old. Hello, how are you doing this afternoon? You want to know how I know what cat it is by just looking at here's a little scrub hair here. Can you get him, Seb? Um, just eye level with you there. He's just on the branch here. He's calling. There he is. Yes, we never get them. It's a white browed scrub robin. And off he goes. That's about as good as you get with those birds. Wow. Well, Cameron, you know, I, since I've been here, I always would say male track or female track. And um, yesterday is the first time I said, this is... And uh, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> Normally, it's the area that you're in. Okay, you know this is kind of the area we find Tundi. This is the area we find this animal. So you can kind of assume... But um, it's not good to assume sometimes. I know that the trackers, the guys who help us out and come on the walks with us, you know, so we've still got not here in the sand. Herbie and Rex will be. I'll just go as far normally and say male and female. But um, with Tingana's tracks being very, very big. Okay, well, it seems like we've got a few gremlins over here down in this depression, which is normal, but we're going to keep following up. But let's go over to Sydney in the meantime. It was also tracking. I am now entering the central part of the game reserve. I am checking one of the dry river beds because all the tracks I found for Tandy are heading towards this direction. Maybe this afternoon I might be lucky and see Tandy somewhere around here. I've got a strong feeling that I might see Tandy this afternoon, although I know it's quite very difficult to guarantee a sighting when it comes to cats. I will try my best somewhere here. Maybe Tandy is hiding. Uh, uh, Google, the big cat is very much uh, 
difficult to explain that they really do bury their dung. Yes, they've got a tendency of kicking the back legs and try to crash the ground like this when they drop the droppings and the, and the urine. But this kind of uh, dust they're blowing at the back and the soil, it doesn't really cover their droppings 100%. From uh, 2007 until now, in 2018, I have never seen a big cat dropping fully covered. So I'm not too sure if other big cats are doing that, but I have never seen it before. Yes, antelopes, I have seen them doing that. Antelopes such as Tien Bokis, I have seen them using their front legs like this, like this, and then they cover and then carry on. But the uh, the animals such as big, I've never seen them doing that, completely covering their droppings. So that's why every time when coming across the uh, cat's droppings, we always show you and tell you how old is it because they're always very nicely here. So let's see what Elf is doing on the other side. Well, everyone, I am still just driving around, so sorry for that. I haven't found anything after those uh, warthogs, so I'm still just having a general squiz and a peek around. Still just trying our best to find one of our leopards or some of the lions maybe moved back in. I do have some fresh elephant tracks here, so... Now, Sid... Good question. What's the difference between a daker and a dick dick? Well, a dick dick is a little bit smaller than the dakers. Now here uh, we don't get many different kinds of daker. We most we only have the common daker or the grey daker, um, but we, we do get all sorts. Just in other areas of South Africa, we get the blue daker, which now there I'm saying um, the dick dick smaller than the daker, but in general because the blue daker. Um, is the smallest of all so that's smaller than all the dick dicks and um, and the smallest one in the Daka family as well but um, I think it's just a slightly different tribe uh, between the the dick dicks and the Daka um, and generally the Daka do have a little bit more of a sort of um, a meaty body the um, dick dicks are a little bit more refined it's almost like the difference between a leopard and a cheetah uh, with the um, dick dicks being more like a cheetah you know, both are uh, territorial um, you know I've seen the the which one was it I've even forgotten now the dick dicks in Kenya it's not is it a Stanley's I can't remember. Anyway, those, those dick dicks there, they're quite special. Um, and then in Namibia, we used to always find the Damara dick dicks, um, which you get in the Waterberg area and also in Itosha. And there's a couple of, uh, there's a real big uh, uh, road there called Dick Dick Drive, where you can see plenty dick dicks. It's right near the Namatoni camp. Um, and just off of uh, Klein Namutoni, one of the water holes there, uh, you can do a whole loop where there's lots and lots of dick dick there. And then next to the Waterberg Plateau Park as well, lots of Damara dick dick up there, and some of them are rather tame. You can actually having, have them coming into the campsite and feeding on the grass in the area there. They also defecate in middens, which is quite funny actually to see these little dick dicks, tiny little dung, and they make a big pile. Um, and obviously, uh, when you first see it, you, you can think, Gish, they, they do poo a lot in one go, but uh, it's obviously over a year or two uh, when they defecate uh, constantly on the same spot. So wonderful, and they're always in the thickets um, and really, really small. The, the Damara dick dick, probably only about so big, um, whereas the the blue daker just slightly smaller uh, than the Damara dick dick and, and all in the same sort of size category as the Sunni as well so all these tiny little antelope uh, very very interesting indeed and quite territorial they defecate in middens they also have pre-orbital glands so they wipe their sort of face on sticks and leave a scent mark like that as well um, so very interesting with a little 
antelope and their tracks are fascinating to follow too. I mean tiny little tracks but real perfect little um, even toed undulates. So two toes um, and almost perfect little hearts like the, like the daker is but smaller, half the size of a common daker. It's incredible. Uh, tiny little toes do they have. Uh, very quick and agile um, just in between the thickets. It's obviously difficult for a predator to follow them in there, especially any kind of sizable predator, but something like a caracal uh, would probably hunt those small little antelope like that. Alright, so the predator search now continues and I think that uh, with the sun slowly starting to head towards the horizon, I think it's about that time, don't you? Yes, well this is almost the time of day that these animals will just pop out for us. Ah, we've got some guys out assisting with some tracking. Just moving out of the way for us, sorry gentlemen. A little bit of a roadblock. Ah, yeah, Wanuna. I am in Jan. I'm Fuki, I'm Fuki. Sharp. They're doing some tracking, looking for animals just like we are. Hopefully, they will be found. That'd be nice. Alec, there's a few edible plants around. Oh, there we go. Let's stop right here. Stop right here and eat one. If you recall me watched me playing a having a challenge with Taylor about this plant right here. They don't taste very nice at the moment. And that's big. Ooh. Some oxpeckers coming up there. When you hear a lot of oxpeckers, you've just got to be careful that it's not a big animal. Here is a buffalo thorn. Oh, exactly. Ow. Very tasty. Buffalo thorn. I'll be doing this in one of my medicinal Mondays coming up. Mm. Substitute for spinach. Very nice substitute. It's going to move out of the way. It's got a little bit of a, it's a busy road this afternoon. And the buffalo thorn, I'm going to show you a branch. Cheers guys. Some landowners from the north using, you know they've got to the, a few people own land and then they bring family and friends. It's really one of those marvellous things you can come out here and bring your friends on game drive. Really, really quite special and that gentleman there actually was a guest of mine a few years ago when I used to work up in the Kruger so that was quite nice. We bumped into them at the watering hole not so long ago. Can you see those thorns there? Alec, can you see them? There's straight ones and there's hooked ones and somehow animals uh. <laughs> it's just not it's just not possible for me to do it with you need very you need very good lips to get on there see we've got hands which allow us to do this but animals do all of this with their mouth very tasty but it's a beautiful story with the buffalo thorn you can see that those thorns go forward and got the straight thorns and then there's a hooked thorn and in the Zulu culture they believe that you always need to be looking to the future but never forget your past. So by looking behind you and looking forward all the time. Because every step you make in the future, you need to also take into consideration what's come from, from your ancestors from, from behind you. And so this plant has actually been passed down from a very, very long time ago. And there's a connection between sort of local traditional uh, beliefs and Christianity in this tree. And so basically very spiritual. Um, first of all, what must have probably happened a very long time ago is this impenetrable plant. If I cut branches of this and lay it down on a grave, hyenas can't get in there. So that's possibly where it first started. They started planting buffalo thorn or laying the branches on top of graves. And then after a very long time, a symbolism started becoming associated with it. Uh, this plant is for the ancestors. This plant, how the connection came about is hard to say. But slowly but surely, they started looking at it as a spiritual sort of 
guide and what they believe is with the hook thorn as well is if a person has passed away one of your family members you can go and you can collect the body and you can bring the body back to the burial site but you've got to take a branch all the way from where you are so I'm living here and I need to go to Johannesburg to go get, fetch my uncle or my cousin who's passed away. I'll take a branch with the leaves and I'll book a taxi and I'll have a seat for the taxi with the branch and I'll go all the way to Johannesburg. A lot of people were in the mines back in those days and go there and to where his body, his spirit passed, go then hook the spirit with the thorn, the hook thorn, hook it into the branch and then bring this back in the taxi, spend a night somewhere paying for a room for the branch and then lay it down on the grave site where the the person is buried so very very spiritual there's lots of history involved in that and those of you who are who are Christian and have Christian faith can look all the way back to Jesus and on the cr on the cross he had a, a plant he had a thorn a crown around his head and this is called Zizifus Mucranata and the thorn that you find on the thorn of Christ are called Zizifus spinochristo. So it is the same family of plant with the same straight and hooked thorn. If you ever look at any of the paintings or any of the depictions of the drawings, you'll see that the thorns on Jesus' head have got straight and hooked thorns because it's the most unpleasant thorny array to, to it'll make you bleed. It really is very, very sharp very very painful and so no doubt 2000 and something years ago these branches were passed around and people went all over the world or all over Africa and the East with branches and they brought stories of this and so African traditional and Christianity sort of mix somewhere in the middle there which I think is very interesting and all that is is a little edible plant that at the moment tastes like spinach very good and we jump back on the vehicle And the roadblock seems to alleviate. That's what I love about um, being out in the bush. There's no roadblocks. Every now and again, you do get a little bit of traffic, but it doesn't last for very long. Talking about traffic, when Sydney's on foot, I guarantee you he's got absolutely none. Where I am now, there is quite a lot of warnings given by quite a lot of different types of birds, and one of them is the southern black teat. So I am not going to talk loud here because that might spoil the chances of seeing what is in the area. Not too sure if it's Tandy or Kalamba, but let me tell you something. Something is happening here where I am. So I'm just going to try by all means and dig and see if we can see what these bed are complaining about. So Hebe, my game scout, uh, requested that I don't have to take long because otherwise they might pick up our presence. Uh, Magic Dragon, what I like the most about the game walks is that a game walk is whereby I experience a close contact with the natural environment. It's a different experience from a game drive. Yes, game drive are also not that bad, but a game walk is the best. So now I am going to follow Herbert because it seems like things are happening. We just want to try and see what is this best trying to complain about. Maybe what we are looking for, Tandy or Kalamba, is here. Let me try and see. I don't want to make any mistake or any noise. I want to avoid the dry branches and the dry leaves so that we can see what is it that is in this area now. So it's very much difficult to select in between these grasses and the leaves because we really don't want to make noise. We want to keep it silent. But I can hear the birds are still complaining. There's quite a lot of noise coming from the direction where we are heading now. Listen to that. So you can hear the birds. They are giving more warning calls. So I just want to try and see what is it that these birds are complaining about now. Yeah. 
Yes, I just saw something moving somewhere there. Not too sure if it was Kalamba, but we are suspecting that Kalamba is somewhere here. So the birds are still complaining, still complaining. We saw a movement, we're just not too sure what movement was that from. So the complainant here I have identified now, the recent complainant, it is the grey, is the grey go away bird. So I can see it very far somewhere there. So it's the one which is talking to me, informing me about what's happening. It's the grey lorry. So I'm just trying to follow uh, Herbert, uh, my game scout here, as we want to try and investigate where we saw. We just missed, we just missed Kalamba here. So it means the little movement we saw going towards this direction, it was, it was Kalamba. You can see there, you can see this is a very, Nice and fresh trek. So I am convinced, I am convinced enough that we have got Kalamba here and the possibilities of Tandi are also very much high. So now let's see what um, Rolf is doing on the other side. Well, look at this, everyone. We just come past Sandy Patch and um, just saw, just tried to see if we could re establish. Oh, look at that. Really displaying for us. Re establish where these little eggs are of this um, little crowned lapwing. And we were, and we did manage to find them. And she came running over now, obviously just wanting to try and shift us along. So we won't spend too long here because it does get a little bit stressful for her. But. Um, we're not doing her any harm. Uh, we're just obviously near to her eggs. But she's doing her best to get rid of us and also not to show us where her nest is. So she's not going to go over to her nest because that would give away the exact location of it. And it's just fascinating to watch this behavior of these uh, lapwings. And she is a pretty little bird as well. And the crown on top with a very yellow sort of eye there. And a very pretty bird they are. But you should start relaxing now, Mommy. Um, we aren't going to do you any harm. I'm sure that she would work it out. But you see how she goes away from the nest. Now, Paula, you say it looks like she looks like she's got a hat on. Uh, well, yeah, there it definitely does, doesn't it? <laughs> Looks like she's got a very bad haircut. Yeah, I've had a couple of those haircuts in my life before, especially when I was young and my mom used to cut my hair for me. And she always used to say how well I looked, but uh, uh, yeah, I think I looked pretty much like that. <laughs> a real nice crown on the crowned lapwing. All right, well, I'm not going to stick around because shame. She's just trying to shift us on, so we'll let her do exactly that and we'll move along for her. Sorry, birdie. Now, Paula, I've got a few favorite birds. Well, a favorite, you've got to pick one, hey. Um, I'd have to say for pure sort of um, finding the bird, yeah, I'll, I'll have a few. Oh, sorry, I can't, I can't pick one. I would say for sheer tenaciousness, like a honey badger of the sky, obviously the forktail drongo is ever present, not scared of anything. Oh, and speaking of birds, we seem to have quite a few of them over here. Those look like Ritz's helmet shrikes. Those are one of my favorite birds. Are they Ritz's? There's a red bulled wood hoop, uh, a red bulled buffalo weaver there, but I'm sure that I saw some Ritz's helmet shrikes. A little bit of a 
bird party here. There's all sorts. There's hornbills, there's starlings, there was a red-billed buffalo weaver, and I'm sure there's also some Retz's helmet sharks. So you can, oh, there's a forktail drongo, just as I was talking about him. So the helmet sharks also, awesome birds. I love how they move around in families. That looks like a red-billed buffalo weaver. I don't know if the other ones were also buffalo weavers or if they were, in fact, helmet shrikes, but there was quite a few of them. They've just shifted off around the back. There's some hornbills as well, and there's also a franklin. There must be some kind of food source here. I don't know if it's termites or something. There we can see the spurfowl having a go. Now, Christy, uh, birds can change the, the kind of tone uh, depending on the predator, um, but you'd have to listen to them very, very carefully. Um, so, yes, they, they could give you a different call if there was a bird of prey or if there was a leopard, but they're not going to give a particular different kind of tone um, if there's you know, a difference between lions, leopard, cheetah, uh, they're just going to alarm for prey. I, I would say that predator on the ground, predator in the air, as that spurfowl now just flies off. Typical ground bird, not particularly comfortable in the air, but they can fly pretty well, having said that. Um, much like the guinea fowl. And forktail drongo always hanging up off on the edges, just looking, waiting for his chance. And so I would have to say another one of my favorites would be a Rupal's Koran that you find out in the desert of N Namibia. A lot of my f sort of uh, more special birds that I've seen are out there. The Rupal's Kor Koran, they do a very uh, sort of a distinctive call where they both of them bob, up their, bob their heads up and down, and the male and female, and you can hear them off from a long distance and they go whap, 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 whap. <laughs> the Rupal's caught on. Um, another one that used to join us when we were sandboarding in the dunes, I was an instructor for that and also used to do videos uh, for them in the dunes, was um, the track, track, chat. The track, ch track, track, chat. Try and say that a few times. Huh? That's a nice tongue twister. It's a beautiful little white chat that you get in the dunes and it always used to come when we started making our sandwiches after we had done our sandboarding. So the track track chat. That is all red bulled buffalo weavers. All red bulled buffalo weavers. So one of the little five and um, well it sounds like Sydney's still looking for one of the big five. After enjoying one of the little five, I am still here after one of the big five. Yes, it's a small cat in terms of the age, Kalamba, but the fact that it's still very young does not mean she's not part of the big five. So where I am now, I am still investigating. I am walking around here to try and pick up the tracks. But what I have realized about Kalamba is that when Tandy is not around, Kalamba is very much shy. So the chances of Kalamba to hide away from, from us they are very much high but we're just trying walking around here and see if we're gonna pick up the evidence and where she's hiding at the moment so we are still after her still trekking Uh, Helen, I am not too sure if the uh, bl the the, the uh, big cats are doing same thing as the small cats. So I have never had a small cat before. Not sure. It's something that I've got to ask to maybe some of my colleagues who has been having some cats before. So, but yes, I know the trust between us and the cats is there. The problem is only whereby there is quite a lot of hunting activities. Where there is hunting activities, animals such as cats, they are too clever to start associating the human beings with the killings. But under normal circumstances, the cats, they maintain their natural human fear. 
So now uh, I just want to try and check and see if we can check around here and see if we're going to reallocate Kalamba. So now let's go to Steve and see. Maybe Steve already got something, not too sure. We found where the bushwalk team is, but uh, we don't know exactly where this little ragabond is. Vagabond is gone. He's around here somewhere. Not 100% sure. We're just going to turn around and have a little look. Hello, Herbie. Here comes Herbie. He's going to come and say hello. Watch out for the buffalo thorn here. Herbs, you come around that side. Hello, my friend. How are you? Good. Okay, where do you think she is? She, she came this, from there. She came this side. Okay, so if you don't understand his sign language, she came from there up towards this way. I'm sure all the viewers are super excited to be seeing Herbie. I'm always excited to see him. So she's... Okay. Okay. Okay, we're going to just do a little little loop around this way. Hey? Okay, well let's see. We're just going to give it a little chance. Not going to spend too much time with with her. If she is willing to be seen. Thanks Herbie. Good luck guys. Hmm, CJ no. She's shy. Uh, just the confidence of not having mum around but shy doesn't mean aggressive leopards are in their nature shy and that basically means to skulk away and move away from any sort of uh, interaction really not to attack a leopard also won't attack you unless it feels cornered or threatened oh watch out there's a very thorny buffalo thorns coming back to to talk to us Okay, it's not far at all from where we found them this morning. Not far at all. Tandy's probably gone off hunting. Just scanning the bushes here. For the cutest little leopard in the world. And this is where the camouflage of the leopard comes into its own. If they don't want to be seen, ladies and gentlemen, well, they won't be. Yeah, girl. Okay, well, we're going to try another little circle here, see if we can be lucky. In the meantime, let's go see if Ralph has any luck his side. So, I hope you've all tried to say five times, track, track, chat, track, track, chat, track, track, chat, track, 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 very, very cool little bird. You should actually look it up. It's um, quite strange. In the middle of the desert, you have a white, a little white chat that hops around on the on the red dunes, um, looking for little insects and so on. But uh, fascinating bird and in, endemic to Namibia. And speaking of birds, I can hear now Koki Franklins. Switch off and roll down. Now, Alec, with a C, um, uh, the most abundant plant, as you can see, while I'm just busy moving down uh, without... I would have to say that uh, the bush willow species are probably one of the most prolific. Um, we've got the red bush willow, which is a bush encroacher. So this is the combretum species, um, as well as the russet bush willow. Um, 
then we've got the lead wood um, and a couple of other ones so uh, yeah um, I would say that a lot of these trees you're seeing here okay there's quite a few silver cluster leaves as well but most of it um, is in fact bush willow and it's fantastic because it is the most awesome firewood as well so um, you know killing two birds with one stone you can use it as, as firewood and also helping it uh, to stop the uh, well help stop the encroachment of the actual species as well because if left alone uh, very much like mopani and sickle bush it can very easily encroach areas that even the animals can't walk go through there you know so um, it's important for elephants uh, especially to keep areas like that open um, that are uh, sort of uh, subject to bush encroachment and if not elephants well then us as humans we can assist and it does keep the balance almost uh, stimulate or simulating uh, the elephants much like uh, to be keep a balanced system as well uh, simulation of predators in the form of hunting okay and I know that's a very controversial subject but hunting or apex predators keeps an ecosystem healthy because you don't have stagnation of the populations you don't have uh, uh, outbreaks of diseases so whether it's predators keeping a population um, uh, sort of rejuvenated and, and and the healthy reproduction of that population and also taking out the weak and the sickly so obviously it's a, it's subject to a little bit of um, uh, uh, decisive hunting if we had to do it to simulate it it um, it does uh, affect the ecosystem in a um, in a positive way so just taking predators out of a system uh, can have a very detrimental effect uh, but you can simulate it as humans in the form of hunting okay so obviously if we had to do that we would like to use everything that we uh, take out and also limit the stress of uh, the animals that are there so something like bow hunting um, but anyway I don't want to get into a debate about whether you should hunt or not um, it just is a fact that if you don't have natural predators around simulating them is a good alternative as we watch the flying banana disappear into the bushes I am still after a Kalamba at this stage and something which is making it very difficult for me to get hold of the fresh tracks is that the ground here where I am, there's too much grass. So here on top of the grass, it's difficult to see any print. So that is something which is making it very difficult at this stage for me to reallocate a Kalamba in this area. So everywhere the area is almost the same. It's like this. This is where Kalamba is, is hiding. So now I will try by all means and see if I can just pick up a tangible evidence showing the direction of movement. Maybe that is going to help me a lot. Uh, Ninamu, the, the leopards, they can change a personality as they get older. The personality of an animal is determined by what is happening in the surrounding. So if these leopards are very, uh, uh, if these leopards are very much social, no problem, nothing, and then the surrounding change the behavior, it's also going to affect the behavior of an animal. So I'm just trying to check all the pathways here, just to pick up one track to confirm the direction of movement so that we can get guided and, and go to the area where we are hoping the Kalamba has been gone to. Yeah, there's too much grass here where I am. Maybe a lot of grazers are not coming much more this side. So, which is making it very difficult. You can see the grasses are just lying everywhere. Animals are not using these pathways very often. So, but maybe we're going to be lucky. Who knows?
So I am not alone looking for a Kidalamba here at the moment. Uh, Steve as well, he is checking around. I'm not too sure if uh, he's got better updates on his side, but let's see. Absolutely nothing. It's very dense. She moved off from the bushwalk team. Don't know exactly how far away she moved. But we've given it another go. I don't want to stress the little youngster at all, so we're going to move out and maybe on our way out we'll find Tandy. Because, you know, ideally you don't want to be seeing the cup cub on her own. She's probably hiding just somewhere where we can't see her. Because that's what she does. Her mom told her, don't let anybody see you. <laughs> She's playing a very good game of hide and seek. So we're going to move out. Keep, see if we can follow up on any activity of Tundi. Get back up to the road there, see if there's any tracks. Well, I'm being called on the radio. Just hang on one second. Standing by. Oh, no negative. Uh, the youngster moved off from the bushwalk team. Uh, we haven't managed to relocate. Okay. So we're going to come out and see if there's any more activity. Maybe go on to the other side of the drainage, see if Tundi's around. Be much better to see the, the Lepidus Tundi. But it is very thick grass here, quite dense vegetation. She's around. Uh oh, watch out for that branch. Teresa, you want to know about um, diseases, leopards and their diseases? Well, hang on a second. I'm just going to have a quick chat with someone that's coming up on my side here. Hold on a second. Not sure. She was in there somewhere. But we're not gonna we're not gonna we're not gonna push it but move on this way have a good afternoon guys okay so Teresa you want to know what diseases leopards can can get well I, I'm really not that clued up on on the diseases front of things I really do need to do some homework TB is definitely something that, that leopards can catch. I, I know for a fact because some leopards that we researched in the Kruger National Park had, had contracted TB, bovine tuberculosis, from the buffalo. So whatever, many viral diseases I suppose, but I'm really not 100% sure. I'm going to have to do some reading up on that. I mean there's probably a number of tick-borne diseases that are, are transferable to cats, but you know that they seem to be quite sort of resilient to, to, to really being emaciated by it. I mean, Tingana was ill. Something made him quite ill quite a while ago, well, two months ago, and he's just bounced back again. So that might have been some, some virus, some disease that he contracted. It's hard to say. And I'm sorry, Teresa, I don't have the answer for you that you might be looking for. I know that I don't think that cats are susceptible to rabies or just canine distemper. But uh, lions definitely have, can contract feline AIDS. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if leopards can contract that at all. But um, they seem to be, you know, the problem with TB and, and leopards is you find lions having TB all the time, especially if they are buffalo sort of eating lions. And uh, you, you get these swellings sort of on the joints and on the elbows. But in a pride, it seems to be okay because there's other individuals that can help the lion to hunt. But with a leopard, every time a leopard misses a hunt, it's, its energy just gets less and less and less. And with the onset of TB, without any cure, well, there's invariably the animal just gets weaker and weaker and weaker and less efficient at doing what they do. I hope that answers a little bit of what you wanted to know. Sorry, Teresa. But I'm sure there's multitudes, multitudes, but not many that are are sort of lethal out here. Lots of diseases transferred between the animals. 
It's the livestock that come into contact with animals out here that just drop like flies. Foot and mouth disease, corridor disease is one that was a big one back in the day. Sleeping sickness, transferred by tsetse flies. Uh, billary, dogs get billary, or also known as tick bite fever in humans. I think animals probably get it, but they just shake it off. Okay, so good area to check for any activity of tunny coming in and out. Okay, well, we're going to carry on looking here, see if we can come up with any tunny signs. In the meantime, let's go over to Ralph for an update. All right, that sounds like a very interesting conversation um, with uh, any diseases that cats get or sicknesses and so on. I mean, obviously, we've seen the sticks prior. They've got that um, the mange, so obviously that can affect cats uh, quite badly, and uh, they can actually die from it eventually. Um, generally not, but uh, it can result in that. And then something that is very, um, well, not, I wouldn't say prevalent, but it has been in the past, is something called FIDS, which is feline immunodeficiency syndrome, much like our AIDS that we get in humans, or the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS, uh, cats get FIDS which is uh, devastating. It can be devastating to populations and I know that there's been serious outbreaks of that uh, in the Kruger National Park itself. Um, and uh, what's crazy is that, and I know that you guys are going to say that I'm hopping on about it in Namibia, once again back in Namibia, um, there is um, populations in Itosha National Park that are immune to FIDS, which is crazy. They don't get it. So they are immune to the immunodeficiency syndrome, or FIDS. So they, um, they don't get it. And so the conservationists in the recent history have, um, have actually taken uh, some of the lions from the Tosha National Park and uh, brought them into the Kruger Park, into the Pilansberg, and into other uh, areas, I think Botswana as well, and trying to breed that gene or that trait into the lions that are susceptible uh, to this FIDS uh, or feline immunodeficiency syndrome. Uh, so it is, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's obviously workable eventually. Um, and that's something that I do know that cats really suffer with is FIDS. And then obviously if they had to get something like mange coupled with FIDS, it would be almost like us um, with AIDS and getting the flu, which normally results in us getting pneumonia and then obviously dying. And, and I know that there are also uh, types of cat flu, um, as we would have heard. So you get cat flu um, and with FIDS, it would be an instant killer. So that's, uh, that's something interesting there. Now, what I thought I would do is because I've been driving around for pretty much the entire drive um, and chatting about all sorts of things, I thought I'd come to a nice little waterhole, Gallego Pan, and we can just continue on the chat because I'm getting a little bit tired of driving. And at least at a waterhole like this, we can watch the little birds coming in to drink. And I'm also hoping as that sun starts setting, we've had a few leopards in the area, so, um, there's every opportunity or possibility that one of them might start rasping um, or chuffing or sawing and all these different names that we give to the call of leopards. Um, and there's a little drongo that seems like he might have come down for a drink. Now, Teresa, good question. Um, I would have to say yes, but I don't think it's like um, the animal going, oh, I feel a little bit uh, like I've got a bit of acid indigestion. Let me go and eat on a sickle bush. I think it's it's more in the vein of, um, you know, when, it, like, for instance, when I exercise or I'm, I'm out in, in the desert of Namibia, oh, the deserts of Namibia, there we go, I'll just sort of throw it in again, um, it's very hot, you sweat a lot, um, and you start craving, uh, well, I start craving biltong and Coca-Cola. So for me, that says that I've got a sugar and salt deficiency, um, 
and, and and that's what I then crave and my body's telling me with those um, kind of things that you know to get that intake of salt and sugar that you know in the modern times built on coke that's that's my way or my brain uh, subconsciously getting me to feed on uh, salt and sugar so I think that like an impala, if they've got particular problems or, or, or they feel a particular way, um, then they might go and feed on a sickle bush or they might go and feed on a silver cluster leaf or on a guari, you know. So all of these different, I absolutely do think that they will feed on different plants uh, if they're feeling a little bit under the weather in different ways or their body's just telling them uh, to go and get uh, the plant that does then satisfy that need um, but I don't think that it's a mental you know oh, I need to go and get some guari um, I think it's just the body almost uh, giving uh, giving the mental craving for for that kind of thing and we've seen the animals all of a sudden moving into areas um, like with the silver cluster leaf that's quite strange for me because uh, uh, it, it, it really what, what is it it's like a purgative it makes your mouth extremely dry it's like um, it's like taking uh, peanut butter and taking a massive tablespoon and putting it in your mouth. It really dries your mouth out that uh, there's no saliva after that and difficult to swallow. So I can't see that it's very tasty and I can't see that it's also got a nice uh, feel to it. But there must be some kind of compounds in that that their body then craves um, and tells the mind to go and get some of that. There's little drongo just wafting around. There were also some Franklin just moving through there. I'm hoping that they're going to go off and spot us a leopard and just give us an alarm call. All right, so it's a very calm afternoon for now, and this uh, drongo is just flitting about and having a good time chasing insects. But it seems like Steve's found something a little bit more sleepy. Yes, well, we finally found you some spots, ladies and gentlemen, and it is a hyena. Notice how I left out the second H. Forward, you can see the other one on the left. There's some landowners there that spotted these hyena for us and told us about it. Very kind of them. And it's very likely that uh, these are the individuals that were that stole, or at least partly stole, food from Tundi this morning. The thoughts are is that Tundi made a kill. And Nahina stole it from her before she could hoist it. Tinkana came on the scene because he heard the commotion. And then Tundi and Tlalumba duly departed. But this hyena is definitely enjoying a little bit of respite in the cool of the drainage line. I was just having a little look in all the trees because last time we saw hyena like this, they were waiting with Hosanna up in the tree feeding on some impala so just having a look around maybe they're just enjoying a bit of comfort down there or maybe there's meat somewhere to be had maybe Hosanna came along eventually and stole it from them and hoisted it somewhere that we can't quite see and they are standing vigil at the bottom waiting for him to come down and I can't see anything apparently there are two there we might go forward in a minute and see if we can get the, a look of the other one. Seb, should I go forward? Go forward just a few metres. Don't fall down the hole there. Rosilo, they, they do look very cute when they're sleepy. Are you good, Seb? They do. Look very cute, I think. <laughs> I think the only time a hyena is cute is when it's a baby. I don't think they're the most attractive of animals, but they do have their own way. I do enjoy them. I just enjoy the attitude they constantly seem to have on their face. Just the uniqueness to what they are and how they've sort of evolved. There's still lots to be learnt about hyenas. I'm still learning. Male and females, difference in sizes, all the things we've always seemed to have known apparently are being thrown out the window. How the, you know, a, a male born into a, a matriarchal female actually sort of inherits his, her rank, and you could actually have a male dominated 
hierarchy. So things that I've always known, sort of the stereotype, apparently are not 100% true. I'd like to read some more about that though. And here are two individuals, one on the left, far bigger than the one on the right. But when a female shows a pseudo penis, very hard to know whether it is a real penis or not. I wouldn't really know how to tell. I've always gone for size as being the indicative characteristic behind a female. And behavior when confronted in a sort of a clan format. And it was quite excellent this morning on the drone. We were able to see, we found a clan of hyena. Not, we first found the one that had stolen the kill from Tandy, and then we found more, and they were doing all sorts of disciplinary action to each other, and a classic sort of submissive behavior as the male, and, or I shouldn't say that, but as the subordinates to sort of, sort of more high-ranking approach each other, and they sort of turn and do the, 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 the genital sort of observation. They present their private parts for inspection. And that's a sign of trust. If you're willing to show your most vulnerable parts to those very powerful jaws, then there must be some trust involved. Joy, it is amazing, Joy from Hong Kong, how they give birth. Um, and most of the time, the females' first litters are unsuccessful because the youngsters almost get... Um, suffocated as they come out because they've got to come out of the clitoris which is essentially an enlarged pseudo penis and it's a very narrow channel in the first birth and uh, so of, often not successful it's very hard to see any of those parts right now no doubt they'll be up and Adam pretty soon this is becoming the time when hyena and leopard to start moving and it's not far away where we left little Lalamba well we didn't find her we didn't see her at all but we're gonna just do a few loops around the block as we go and hopefully hopefully we'll be finding um, Tundi materializing back on the scene Well, the Bushwalk team is finding all the spots this afternoon. Let's go back over to Sydney. I, I have been trying by all means to get hold of uh, Talama, but uh, I saw there is no luck. So now I decided to move on and I have got one of the lovely animals. You can see him browsing there. That is a female uh, giraffe. The, the, the male and female giraffes, when it comes to the feeding behavior, it's, there's a little bit of uh, tendency done by the females. Females, they prefer to bend their neck. Males, mostly, they, they browse from the top. Browsing is just another way of saying feeding on leaves. Browsers are the animals that eat leaves. So that one, from how uh, she was feeding, I can tell that is a female. If you look there on top of those things coming out, if they are, they are hairs there, then it means it's a female. Males, they are bald on top of those horns. Right on top of the horns, males don't have any hairs. Females, they've got some hairs. And males, they've got thick oxycones. Females, they've got thin oxycones. So that is how you can easily distinguish. So you can see that this giraffe, all the giraffe is looking for now is to have a final diet. Giraffes, they don't mostly feed at night. At night is when they can relax. And how the giraffe sleeps, here is going to become very interesting. They've got to kneel down like this. They've got to kneel down and they are not allowed to lay down their head. If they lay down their head, the blood is going to flow up to the brain. And once the blood get to the brain, they are going to die. So the giraffes, they must have to every time kneel down just like a bed. That is why when the giraffes are going for drinking 
as well. You will see they must have to drink and then they stand and they carry on drinking. Because if they face down for a lot of time, then it does affect their brain. They do have some of the valves on the neck where they are helping to stop the blood transport when they are doing some other things. But they have got to open them and close every time. So that is quite a very lovely animal. So you can see with the reflection of the sun from the sunset, it's looking very much camouflaged. Look at those spots. Beautiful. I cannot see if these other giraffes nearby, but mostly giraffes, they walk as a group. It's a journey. I can see he's trying to check. He's trying to check if there are other uh, family members, but it seems like uh, there is nothing there. Maybe they are there, it's just that we, the position where I am, maybe it's difficult to see their other friends. I am sure that this giraffe is not alone because the concentration of her eyes, the focus, is telling me that there are more other giraffes in this area. So let's see the hornbill on the ground. Ralph has got a lot to talk to you about. Well, these hornbills have really been keeping us entertained here next to the waterhole. Uh, they've been really breaking up the buffalo dung and the elephant dung as well. That one just gone now behind the bushes there. But we've got some birchels. Oh, there, there's another one a little bit closer to the water. Well, oh, no. No, it's not. It's in a bush or something else. But um, we've got birchel starlings and we've got... Oh, here comes a... It looks like a Cape turtle dove. On his way in, probably for a drink. It's wonderful to watch everybody now making their way down for a drink. And you'll see, if this little turtle dove does go for a drink, that he's got a gullet. So he's not going to have to lift his head up um, to swallow it down like the, uh, well, pretty much most of the rest of the birds have to. So he's probably just looking for his ideal spot with the elephant dung there in the background. Now he's looking for probably a little bit away from the wind. Let's see now. He'll be able to drink without having to lift his head. See that? Because he's got a gullet. Interesting, hey? So they can drink much quicker than the other birds. And that's probably one of the reasons why they're so successful. Because it's definitely not down to their nesting habits. Because if you've ever seen the Cape Turtle Dove's nest, it's ridiculous. It's a couple of sticks in normally a very loose branch of a tree. They get blown around in the wind. The eggs often fall out. Um, and so definitely not because of their nesting tactics and that have made them successful. But I think one of the reasons they don't get predated on next to the waterhole as much is because of this very quick way of drinking. Um, having said that, I've watched jackals hunting doves next to waterholes, creeping up behind little rocks and so on, and it is spectacular the way that they jump because obviously the, the birds do hear them at the last minute and then fly up and the jackals fly up in the air after them and uh, it's wonderful to see and I've sat and watched them uh, at the Okokuyu waterhole uh, in Initosha National Park for hours and hours in the middle of the day when there's nothing else happening and you've got these jackals stalking doves next to the waterhole it's awesome always something to watch making for a beautiful reflection there now as well. So just enjoying the bird life at the moment. I'm, the arrow-marked babblers are maybe making their way through the thicket behind us, making a racket, as babblers do. I'm sure you can hear them. Now the barred owlets have started to call. This is nice spending time in one spot, especially when we've been driving around for so long. And this is a very productive spot here. And there's Senzo getting the artistic um, sunset as it's starting to go through the trees there now. And the perfect time to be sitting here 
waiting. And that's, that's also very cool because once you finish there, you can go over to the other side where the moon has risen and it is also starting to be very beautiful. It's, um, we're heading towards full moon and I'm sure you know all about what's going to be happening with that full moon. There's also going to be an eclipse coming up soon. So off we go to the other side, making you work, Senzo. There you go. Got it in your keep, eh? There it is. <laughs> easy em keezy. There's the rabbit. I can always see those two ears poking up at the top. I'd say it's a scrub here, but I think it's either tomorrow night or the next night. So just a smidgen more to go with that full moon coming up. Very pretty. So we'll sit here and let's hope for a leopard that's going to let us know exactly where he is. But from a leopard with spots, hopefully, let's head you on over to a very tall beast. I have got now a few other members of the very same family. I can see three from here where I am. The giraffes, that giraffe we saw earlier, it was not alone. I managed to get hold of the uh, male as well. It's just that now the sighting is not that very much clear. Uh, they are hiding behind these bushes. Yes, it's very much dry at the moment. And most of the trees that are still having the leaves they are very much short when it comes to their size i can see they are hiding because they are trying to get food from the bottom i have got a question from uh, rosinda yes rosinda i have been on a sighting on several occasions whereby the lions manage to take down a giraffe. They even take down the adults, fully grown giraffe. What the lions do is that they go to the water holes and wait for the giraffe to come. And they know the giraffes, how they drink, they've got to bend their legs like this, and then they go down. When these giraffes go down, they tend to become an easy prey. And then these animals just jump and they catch them from the neck. So I have seen that happening. Lions, they, they do go and catch uh, the giraffes. But sometimes they also take down the, the youngsters, the ones which are not that very much tall. Uh, I have seen them also considering them for a diet. So looking at these giraffes, looking at these giraffes, uh, you can see that when just looking at them, you cannot even think that the giraffes can be able to defend themselves against the predators. Because if you can look at the horns, their horns are not that very, they are, they are not that very big, they are very short, and what they have got, equipment they have got for fighting predators is not the horns. They don't use those horns for predators at all. They kick the predators. Their horns, they use them in order to fight against other members. So you will see, this is how they fight. They strangle their necks. And when they strangle their necks, they just do like this. They swing the head and they hit each other's uh, side like here. When they're strangling every time doing this, is how they fight. They do this. They use those horns. So they can't be able to uh, get the predator up, make use of those horns. If they do that, they will be, again, reducing their size and give the predator an accessibility to target here. So that's why they've got to kick rather than to use those small horns. They don't really have horns. It is called an oxycones, rather than to use their oxycones. So now I'm just going to try and see if we are going to find something else. But before, I am going to take a question. 
Uh, Sina, the giraffe mating is very much interesting. I have seen it there, not once, not twice. It doesn't take very long, but it's very much interesting. The males, they, they go after the females and they try by all means to access the females and they manage to access. So I have seen it a lot. And during their mating activities, the males, they produce a very distinctive smell. And that smell is what these males are using in order to attract the females for mating activities. So now I'm just going to see if we're going to find something. But now uh, let's see, maybe there are some other updates here in the reserve. We have found probably the largest dead leadwood in the area and I can't help get out of the vehicle and come over and give it a hug. I know it's not alive anymore, but sure, look at the size of this guy. Incredible. Look at this. Isn't that fantastic? huge giant like this can live to over a thousand years you can imagine the roots are probably equivalent underground what they are above and a huge amount of it has fallen down on the ground a huge amount and those are very heavy stumps I'm going to find one for you heavy stumps like this that will sit on the ground for a very long time there's a there's a spider there's some interesting bug over here. All sorts of organisms will live underneath these pieces of wood on the ground. So I'm going to put that back there so I don't damage the ecosystem. Put it exactly where I found it. So I was talking about it being a, a favorite firewood. Those pieces of wood are beautiful to burn, but you know, you're going to take away things around that are lying around the tree here that are providing ecosystems, providing habitat, providing niche areas for these animals to reproduce. There's more here. There's lots and lots of logs around. They're just offshoots that have fallen off of the top of the dead tree, and that can stand for over a hundred years. And the branches on the ground, long time. Fire even. It's very hard to burn them. You need a lot of fire to get them burned, but they can burn the longest ever. They had a leadwood stump burning in the Kruger Park. It was burning probably a big tree, and uh, they recorded it burned for an entire year. Entire year, constantly burning. Every time it would die down, the wind would come and build it up again. So just the ash and the coal inside burning, burning, burning. It's a really, really special. Ah, oh, magnificent. Can you imagine what that must have looked like in the day? and why many, many traditional people could, could assume that their ancestors live inside a tree like that. And when they walk past one, they pay respect. Makosi, makosi. Very good. Okay, well, there's been no other sign. We left this hyena. No other sign from, um, from we just came in onto the other side where we had Tlalamba to see if we could maybe see her again, but there's been no joy of Tandi either. It's getting to that time of day where you expect to see them moving. We're just going to go back down towards the drainage here. Yvette, yes, I love my trees too. I do love my trees. I do spend a little bit more time looking at them on my bushwalks, but on an afternoon like this, we, you know, when we know where the characters were around, it's, it's always quite nice for us to try to follow up on them which is what we were trying to do, obviously. But it's not over yet. Not over yet. Okay, well, it seems like Ralph is not finished yet either. He's found some birds. Well, these little doves still just keep coming in for drinks. And the doves are coming in for drinks. The drongo is just flitting above the waterhole, uh, catching insects. And there was a crested barbet a minute ago. There was a hornbill that didn't like that the crested barbet may have found something to eat. So he chased him off and then flew off as well. Oh, no, he's actually still here. He's just hiding behind this log there over there. I can hear some red-billed oxpeckers coming in. 
Now, C-neck, well, the drongo can do pretty much all of the uh, bird alarm calls because they can mimic very, very astutely. So they can pretty much do any of the um, bird's alarm calls. Uh, I, I think I've even heard them doing a, a go-away bird call, but um, mostly, yo, he's flying backwards and forwards. He really is very um, good in the sky, isn't he? Um, so from the pearl spotted owlet to barred owls or owlets um, to grey go away birds, I haven't heard them doing a squirrel. But you know, it's hard to tell because unless you see the bird actually doing the call, you wouldn't know if it was a squirrel or if it was a drongo. And that's half the reason why when we're walking through the bush, sometimes you've got to really check around and actually make sure that you identify that it's not a drongo calling because you might think that it's something else. He's all over the place there. Now, um, I just want you to have another quick look at the moon, because while we were sitting here, I said there's a rabbit there, but um, Senzo reckons, and it's actually pretty awesome, he says that there's a doggy there with um, glasses on. So those two big round balls with his nose in the middle and then a little smiley face underneath it. And now I can see it way better than I could the the rabbit. <laughs> so um, why don't you send us in... Uh, oh, and um, Meg says that she sees a snail. I can't quite see that. But what I want you to do is take your screenshots and draw what you see on the moon as clear as it is now and send it uh, to us at the hashtag Safari Live. What do you see in the moon? I see a rabbit. Uh, Meg sees a snail, and uh, Senzo sees a dog with glasses on. So that's uh, fascinating. Let's see what your imagination runs away with you on those, as we now carry on watching the doves and the drongos enjoying the waterhole area. Oh, there's a couple of spur fowls making their way in. Oh, there's the crested barbet, Senzo. There he is, jumping around like a tattooed punk. There he is, and they're all coming in just to sort of have a look inside all the elephant dung that's lying here because there's very often some insects and things in there as well and I think the crested barbet maybe also pick up on some of the berries or fruit that maybe the elephants eaten so and that passes through in their dung there's, is that a starling no it's a red bull buffalo weaver I think hey, hopping around in the grass wonderful bird watching here by the water hole and it goes up onto the termite mound Having a look down the hole, do you think he's shouting down? Hello, anybody down there? <laughs> okay, we're being rather silly now, but it is um, wonderful here next to the water hole. Oh, there's a second one. <coughs> okay, so it looks like the bird watching is all happening, and while you all are thinking about your moon and the imagination is running wild, let's head you on over to Sydney, who's got one of the night watchmen. It has been a very fantastic argument uh, between Senzo and Ralph about the the dog and the rabbits. But on my side, hey, I think that is the rabbit. So I'm supporting one of them. So I've got one of the very lovely nocturnal. I am glad to find this nocturnal bed just before I close down with the guided walk. This is the pale spotted owl. It's one of those smallest owls we have got in the reserve. And they can, they can hide nicely and they can get very camouflaged. And what I like the most about this kind of uh, owls or this kind of birds is that they, their eyes are too big. And something you're going to notice when you see them, it will be their big eyes. So their eyes are so very big and that restricts them from blinking their pupil. But that is compensated. The fact that they cannot blink their pupil, it does not mean they cannot see very well. That, that kind of a bed can be able to see on a dim light 10 times than we do. How is it compensated the, the, when it comes to the pupil? The head can be able to turn 270 degrees. So, and that is compensating the issue of moving the, the pupil. So, in other words, the fact that they cannot 
move the pupil doesn't mean they are negatively affected when it comes to moving their head. They can turn that head 270 degrees. These owls can see very well. And how they hunt is very much interesting. They can, on a silent flight, on a silent flight, they can be able to land and grab what they are looking for. And they can even catch something which is fast as the elephant shrew. Elephant shrew is one of the of the of the mice, and this is very much small in terms of the size. It has got a tubular mouth, just like an elephant trunk, and it's one of the small five. The small five are just those animals whose names are resembling the names of the big five. So I think this is going to be my last presentation tonight. And thank you very, very much for all your questions and for having me as your presenter. I hope you have enjoyed. So Rolf is going to take for it is going to take on now from me i will be now heading home as the nocturnal life has just started now on a guided walk is very much dangerous so well goodbye sydney and uh, hope you make it home in one piece uh, we are still here in one piece and now here there's quite a few uh, different uh, thoughts about the moon. Someone said they think there's a shrimp and someone said it looks like there's a human hand. Um, so let's have a look there. I wonder where can we see the shrimp while we're waiting and listening out for leopard uh, rasping here next to the waterhole. Um, I want to see the hand. Uh, I can't see the hand. A shrimp? A fingerprint, you say, Senzo, a handprint. But, well, I mean, you've got to have quite a good imagination to see the rabbit. Um, but anyway, oh, look here, Senzo, let's go down to these drongos. They're having a little bit of a family tiff. These two. Not, I think the one is not happy that the other one's now come and spoiled his party next to the water hole. He's, he wants all these insects to himself. There were quite a few of them the last time we came here, and they were all quite happy eating insects all together. And this one just flying backwards and forwards. See, he's obviously after the insects that will be uh, probably breeding here in this water hole. And there's not too much water around, so this is probably one of the only food sources of this nature in the area. So probably prime spot for a little drongo. I love watching them. They're very agile flyers. Not like a hornbill, which is very um, clumsy in its flight. Sort of flap, flap, glide. Flap, flap, glide from the, the hornbill. But these guys, they do what, what we also term hawking. Um, uh, little um, bee eaters do it. Sometimes kingfishers do it as well. Hawking is flying... Um, uh, sort of catching an insect and flying back to the same spot. And that's what you call hawking. Um, and the drongo do it too. And as I said, the bee eaters often do that. Here comes another one in. I'm sure they're going to have a little bit of a tiff. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Crazy. Uh, that one really defending his turf. See what I mean? These drongos, they're not scared of anything, including another drongo. And he did seem to shift that other one off now. I'm sure he'll be back, though. Oh, sounds like Megan says there's more moon comments. What else do we have? Is there a man sitting with a fishing rod? Carol, you say Mickey Mouse? Yeah, that, I can see that. It looks like, a, uh, I would say, also a big piece of cheese that's been eaten by a mouse. Yeah, Mickey Mouse at that. Uh, and we can just see the colors now that are starting to come through, just slowly piercing the pinks and blues. And now, Kathy, you see a seahorse. Ah, I can picture that going off from sort of quite large at the bottom and then curling off to the right and then finishing off with a small curl to the left. I can see that. And while we're sitting here, once again, I was here yesterday and we can hear this little paradise flycatcher calling. Wamp, 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 with the drongo serenading us in flight. 
Awesome. Okay, so we've got shrimps and mice and fingerprints and all sorts. Dogs with glasses on. Paula, you say moldy cheese? Yeah, I, I can see the cheese, but I, I see bites of mouse bites out of it. So, yeah, but that could also be moldy cheese. A bit of blue cheese. Maybe. Or a little bit of moldy goat's cheese. There we go. <laughs> You can actually see the craters and everything, eh? A magic dragon, you say is, you see a, a, a giant dragon egg? Yeah, that's that's quite a good one. It's very round. But I could, yeah, I could picture that. It looks like a ten pin bowling ball with the holes on the top. Ah, that looks like, my, or the cushione for le boule or pitonk. Ah, so the three most popular is the bunny, the dog, and the seahorse. Nice one. That's very cool, everyone. Okay, so don't forget, in a couple of nights, depending on where you are in the world, you're going to have a, um eclipse, and we're, uh, we're also heading to a very, very uh, important or very unusual full moon. So we'll chat about that when it gets a little bit closer. I think Steve's already chatted about it, but um, I'll save that for a couple of nights and we'll chat about it even a little bit more. Um, so I don't know if Steve wants to chat about it a little bit more because I know that he started it. Well, the eclipse is a magnificent thing. We're starting at 25 minutes past 8 tomorrow evening, South African time. And uh, that would be... And then it goes on for about four hours. It's going to be the longest one, apparently, this century. We're only 20, only 18 years into the century. And it's going to be um, a beautiful blood moon because of the reflection of the, the light the earth is going to absorb a lot of the, the sort of colors and just the red is sort of going to get around and it's going to light up the moon. It's going to be very, very beautiful. Very, very beautiful. I wish it was a bit earlier in the day because that's kind of the time I want to go to bed. <laughs> but anyway, that's just me. Mina Moo, very good question. Very good question. Um, well, I'm looking for Tundi, but you want to know which predator would take uh, advantage of the full moon, uh, of the of the eclipse? It's a very good question. I mean, it's going to darken the sky, but it's not going to be pitch black. There's still going to be reflection, but it's going to be a lot lighter, a, a lot darker than it would have been with the full moon. So I think all the predators would take advantage of it, really. You know, I don't think the animals will would know what happens. They would be like, okay, I'm just in a pile of there looking. Can you see her, Seb? Yeah. It's a characteristic sort of ears forward. Predators will take advantage of any opportunity they can. And, you know, suddenly it hits 25 minutes past 8 and it, the moon slowly starts to dim and dim and dim and then suddenly it's dark. I don't think the herbivore or the prey animals know there's a difference. They just suddenly think, okay, why has it suddenly got so dark? Hmm. A little bit of a, a leg stretch. Obviously nothing too concerning. The time to groom a beautiful female impala. No doubt there's a whole lot more in the thickets there somewhere. I can't really see. Being on your own in an area where Tundi's hanging out? Oh, not a good idea. Angie, I think full moons have the potential to affect everybody, really. I mean, we're, what, 70% water? Something like that? The moons have the potential to affect the oceans, so how can they not affect us and the animals? I, I feel I get a little bit affected by a full moon. I'm not going to comment on anybody else, but a number of people I've spoken to in the past definitely feel the full moon. It's a beautiful time. Second one this month making it a blue moon and it'll be a red blood moon second one I get to see this year the last one I saw in the Mara was fantastic really really good 
It looked so much bigger up there for some reason. Don't know how that's possible. Okay, well, you've stared enough at the moon this evening with Ralph, no doubt, with all of your wonderful um, ideas of what is up there. What is on the other side is another question. We never see the other side of the moon. All sorts of theories out there. Postulations. Okay, well, anyway, we're doing a big loop around. We've done all sorts of loops that side, and we're just hoping by chance to sort of come across Tundi moving back towards where she might have secreted Tlalamba. She might be on the other side of the drainage for all I know. A little bit of luck going on here. A little bit of luck. The, the tracks of that leopard that I had earlier, that male leopard, were driven on. So probably from yesterday or from early this morning. But I didn't manage to find too much of a direction except for a bit south. But that is quite broad. So it's going to be a bright evening with that moon up in the sky. So herbivore or the prey animals are going to be a little bit more, feel a little bit safer out here in the wilderness. But it is always wild, it is always dangerous, as Ralph Kirsten will tell you. Yes, absolutely. Um, but uh, what I like about full moon is it uh, generally means good surf. Uh, back where I'm from, I like to uh, hit a bit of a surf. So spring tide um, normally results in uh, good conditions, big waves. We do like it when it's a bit bigger, the more you do it. So yeah, it definitely makes for good things like that. But also um, on the sad side of things, it generally makes um, uh, the poachers a little bit more brave. So this is the time uh, when vigilance needs to be uh, adhered to during these periods because uh, this is often when there's a, a serious spike in poaching. So yeah, that's the sad side of things. Um, but uh, anyway, I've uh, left our little water hole and decided just to do a bit of a loop up in Vubu um, and back down Galago Shortcut, see if I can find this leopard that was walking around um, about lunchtime. Now, proud cat mama, uh, the advantage that a hyena has over a lion, and, and, and in particular female lions, um, I would say the way that they band together, they're, um, they are seriously tough animals. I would say pound for pound, they're actually tougher than lions. Um, and the same goes with their, with their jaw strength. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, uh, five female hyenas against five female lions, it could go either way. Um, and you know, if, if, a hy if, a, if a lion bites a hyena, um, it doesn't get affected as badly as if a hyena bites a lion. Um, so I do think that the hyenas have got a higher pain threshold. Um, but throw one male lion in there and it's just like skittles. So, um, and it is almost like in the cartoons. Um, and those hyenas just go flying. So yeah, that's, uh, hyenas got, you know, some small advantages over the lions and especially if they can band together in bigger numbers. You often find hyenas in much larger numbers than lions as well. I mean, there in the Masai Mara, we're talking 80 plus, some, in some cases, with, with the lions. So, I mean, if, you, if you're looking at 15 to 20 lions, that's a decent sized pride. 30, 35 is probably the maximum or biggest prides that we do get currently in modern day times. Um, so, you know, lions generally, generally uh, be outnumbered by the hyenas. So that's also one of, you know, one of their biggest advantages um, that the hyenas have. And just their tenaciousness, the way they spread out, and once they call, they can come from anywhere as we just negotiate this little spot coming down here. So yeah, yeah. I know I'd love to find this this uh, Juma Den of the hyenas.
Now, Carol, I don't know if hyenas have the most complex social structure. They are seriously intelligent, um, and I think they have possibly one of the most misunderstood social structures and one of the reasons I say that is because they're so difficult to follow and find dens etc so I think it's easier to study lions for instance in comparison to hyenas um, and they're so difficult to follow so finding their dens um, trying to follow them it's extremely difficult and I mean like now what Jamie is doing in the Maasai Mara I was doing it a little while ago sitting at the den uh, almost every single morning um, that's where you start to see quite a lot of this social interaction um, within the group and uh, you know that's that's not very easy to do especially like here on Juma um, we, we don't have we can't find their den for now if it is indeed on the property we've really been searching around because if you've ever tried to to track and trail um, a hyena, you would know that it, it is, you can, you know, you find fresh tracks uh, now, this morning, um, on Juma, and you try and follow it, that hyena, even though that that track was maybe within an hour's old, hour's time frame, it could have walked 25 to 30 kilometers with a jog in between and so on. So it's, you know, you, even though you can find a fresh track and you can think this is worth following because we could really find this animal, it, most of the time it's it's almost impossible to find them so they are one of the most difficult animals to track even though their tracks are so clear to actually find the animal is very difficult because um, of the way that they move and they can move you know between 50 and 80 kilometers in one night um, and sometimes even more in different areas depends on the terrain and the and the and and um, the sort of area as well. In the Namib Desert they move more than a hundred kilometers in one night there quite easily. Um, so it's seriously interesting um, but at the same time we don't understand them because we don't have as much information in comparison to the other animals. So now it's heading into the night time maybe we'll find some but Steve's gone into infrared. We are in infrared and we're just slowly making our way around this block still. See if we can find anything. Listening, stopping and listening as we go. We're listening for those characteristic shouts of Franklin and Spurfowl and Yala or two. Impala. It's always indicative of Hello Nikita. Owls predators generally are other owls. Um, owls. Oh, hang on, there we go. What's that? I think that's a daker. Seb, can you just see through there? I'm just going to have a quick look with my binoculars. I'm going to go back. That might be exactly what we're looking for. No, it is not. It is. Oh, gears. It's very small to the ground, possibly a daker. Sorry, Nikita. I'll get back to your question in a moment. This is exactly where Tlalamba was seen in this area. There's a daker there. Can you see it, Seb? There it is. Just moving. They've got that, that size to the ground and the eyes are so close to each other and the eye shine they give off is very characteristic of a cat. I'm getting good at it though. I think it's a daker immediately but it's always worth investigating. So we can hear in the background, actually, Nikita, we can hear a scops owl, a little And before we heard a barred owlet, 
which I'm not going to mimic now, a pearl spotted owlet, also they call. But the little owls are predated upon by bigger owls quite often, and so they hide away and move away from bigger owls. They don't like bigger owls, and obviously the biggest owl is, is the, the, the chief in charge. But then birds of prey, uh, fish eagle will chase any owl, um, any large raptor will chase an owl if they can find them. Uh, snakes can potentially be a problem from time to time, and um, in their nests as well, they can be pred predated upon by sort of scavenging uh, animals such as um, I, would, I would say genets maybe even a leopard but I wouldn't say leopard too often but generally owls are predators are predated on by owls hope that answers your question just the way it is it's the competition in the world not necessarily hunted for being eaten they probably might eat them afterwards but it's all about competition the larger predators always seem to try and sort out the smaller predators so that's why we have this sort of separation of of some of your smaller owls being sort of crepuscular active early hours of the dawn in the evening versus nocturnal yes Monique in London the scops owl when we can find it very hard to find it's Monique's favorite owl I do enjoy them, They're very hard to see. You can find them by their call, that very high pitch. <laughs> I hope I'm doing it justice a little bit. But they are very hard to see, they're extremely camouflaged. They even have a little bit of, of a feather sort of overlap on their beak. So you can't even see their beak, it doesn't even stand out. They're very funny looking owls. They look like the bark of a tree, which is exactly what they need to do exactly what they want okay last minute leopard coming up well we've just found a hyena on the side here this looks like a little youngster no doubt the youngsters going to be moving in towards the area of Tandi. There was some food there this morning. I didn't see it, but I heard all about it. We might uh, stick with this little this little animal for a while and, and move with it and see where it's going. We're not going to go off-road, just follow it along the, the pathway here, see exactly where it's going to. Jocelyn, I love the calls that they make. You wanna, Jocelyn wants to know my favorite thing about hyenas. I love the noises and the cackling they make when they have a little squabble. And I love the, whoo, the, the whooping sounds they make. They, they're the most uh, just variably vocal of all of the animals. Moving directly into the area where Tlalamba was seen. So that's the reason why we don't wanna hang around. On a, with a cub on its own because if hyenas come you don't want to be in, involved in any of the whatever might happen but if Tundi's there it's generally fine but that's why I don't spend too much time trying to follow up on a cub on her own just my opinion uh, other people might do it differently but uh, hyenas moving directly across the drainage there sort of towards where she was maybe we'll come around again down into the drainage see if we can see anything okay but I think while we do that Ralph Kirsten is also out and about with his spotlight Let's see what wonderful tales in the African wilderness he has got for you. Well, let's, um, uh, I'm glad that at least Steve has uh, found a hyena. That is fantastic. I'm very jealous. I do like uh, my friendly friends, the hyenas, as you all know. Oh, hello. Uh, shame. It was just a... A little fiery neck nightjar, one of our friends that calls in the night. So they are out at the moment and along this oh, we've got a drongo that's a little a little bit late to bed. Uh, sweet history, I'm going to try my best to find a bush baby. All right, that's our mission now. Um, as we see that drongo now flying off, I'll do my best to find a bush baby. Let's see what we can do. Coming down into this drainage line, it is the perfect time for them to be out. The sun is down, it's cooled off, and I'm sure they'll be jumping around now. So we've got to look out 
the little eyes beaming or reflecting back at us up in the trees, not in the thorny trees. They don't generally jump around in those. They seem to identify which ones they should be jumping in. Let's see what we can find. I like it when they're in the bush willows because then we generally we are able to see them a bit easily as well and they don't jump too far then. So, let's see. Wonderful. Lesser bush baby. Oh, there's some antelope there, as opposed to the thick-tailed bush baby. They don't jump around as much as the little lesser, and they can't jump as far. Now, Mona, um, a, little, a bush baby looks a little bit like a, a very cute monkey, um, or, you know, something like, um, what are those things, those llamas, I think, uh, in, in the Amazon, um, you know, but not, not with such a big tail. They're small little uh, creatures, the lesser bush baby I'm talking about, with a nice big fluffy tail, not very long though, um, and they jump around in between the trees. They can jump up to five meters, the little lesser bush baby, and they make lots of little high-pitched squeaks and wee beep beep wee beep beep wee beep beep wee beep 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 Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Those are the calls they make, but the reason they're actually called bush babies, um, and it's from the, the Latin Galago, uh, or the scientific name, but um, they're called bush babies because of the uh, thick-tailed bush baby's call, which is like a crying baby. It goes, ah, 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 and so it does sound like a, a baby in the bush. And so bush babies, or Galago, the scientific or Latin name. And uh, they also sound very similar to tree hyrax. And when I, when I first went to the Maasai Mara, when I arrived, I thought that there was um, bush babies, uh, thick-tailed bush babies everywhere. And later realized that it was, in fact, um, the, the tree hyrax that make a very similar call to the thick-tailed bush baby. Now there's something there in the road. I think it's a fiery neck nightjar. Yes it is and I'm going to stop just here, not any closer because we should be able to get a nice view on it. Uh, Senzo, you must just tell me if the torch is needed or not. Yeah. See that? Pretty little birds and if we can get in nice and close. I don't know if you'll be able to see those very bristly feathers around the mouth which they actually use when they fly around at night. These are insect-eating birds. But if you ever see their gape, which is basically how much they can open their mouth, it is incredible because they can open it massively. Um, and obviously with them flying around in the dark, uh, quite difficult to spot the insect. So they do get pretty close to it. And then they've got these bristles on the outside of their mouth that helps to sort of push the insect towards the mouth. And then they've got this massive open mouth in comparison to the bird. So it's incredible, and I'm just glad that we get to spot them. They also have one of the most iconic calls, and, well, what more could be iconic than a hyena calling? Yes, well, hyena. Ralph was really keen to find some hyena today, and we seem to have had the luck. Uh, that one we found moments ago was a different one to what we saw earlier, because here we've come back we found those two and they are sniffing the ground they're sniffing as they go they're walking they're tracking i know i was talking i think it was yesterday about how animals follow with their noses now they could follow anything and invariably they follow leopards they like to steal food from leopards especially very successful ones like tundi and so invariably they could follow her trail on the ground just by using their noses which i think is quite incredible quite incredible you can see the one on the right is definitely bigger than the one on the left and the belly shows that they got the lion's share of the high of the, whatever they fed upon nostrich that's a good question i think um brent brent was telling me there's a, a group in the mar of about 70 odd animals in a in a clan whether they hunt all together like that is hard to say but that is an enormous an amount of hyena an enormous amount um, I've never really seen anything more than about 20. What have you got there, young one? 
Sorry, it stopped in front of me. I've never really seen more than 20, but the Mara is where you get these huge populations of hyena. Let's see if we can move up again. Oh, we've actually still got one just right here. Seb, busy looking. Oh, here we go. We've got a greeting ceremony happening in front of us. Let's have a listen, folks. Here we go, showing their most private parts for inspection. You can see this individual closest to us has got those bite marks on the bottom there. That's probably a low-ranking individual. Uh, we saw it with some fresh wounds the other day. And that is either a penis or a pseudopenis. I don't know, folks. I couldn't actually tell the difference anymore. They both have one. A little bit of scent marking. Okay. And they come right past us again. How fantastic is this? Lauren, the, the young female, so the young sort of matriarch youngster will start following from about a year, will start following the clan hunting, but um, maybe even a little bit older than that before it becomes part and parcel of the group itself. Let's just go back a bit, see if we can see them wandering off into the wilderness there. But um, the, on their own itself, they'll probably go with an adult for some time until until they get big enough um, if they get caught up by a lion or something there we go those two are now doing a greeting ceremony sorry Seb are you right? yeah you are fine. this happens all the time constantly when they reaffirm each other re-see each other they've got to greet and and show submissiveness and if one doesn't doesn't bow the head correctly or doesn't step in a certain way they get disciplined it happens very very quickly In a night of hyena it is going to be. No doubt we'll be finding some again later on. We're going to be doing some, some more drone tests this evening. And then we've got some more rehearsals in the morning, followed by another hour from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock South African time. So I hope you will be joining us for that. And as the hyena disappear into the wilderness, let's see if we can hear them once more. Just have a last moment of thought. A beautiful afternoon it has been in Druma in the Sabi Sands. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Your comments and questions have been fantastic. We hope to see you again tomorrow morning and every other show forthwith. And thank you for joining us from Sebastian, FC, Ralph, the Bushwalk team, including all of the others hard behind the scenes. Thank you very much and have a very good evening. Good night.